Okay, Mr. Marshall, you have a full house. It is 6.31, according to my computer. Amherst Media is here in the house. You're good to get started. Okay, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of October 19th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the State Legislature on July 16th, 2022, this Planning Board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which it lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. <clears throat> Bruce Coldham. Here. Uh, Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, please remember to remute yourself. To the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. <laughs> Excuse me. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the time now on our, my clock is 636. Uh, the first item on there, our agenda uh, are our minutes from past meetings, and I believe we have the minutes for our last meeting on September 21st. Uh, those were concluded in the packet. Uh, Johanna, I see your hand. I reviewed the minutes and I move to approve them. Okay, thank you. Would anyone like to second that motion? Uh, we will still have conversation if anybody has comments. Tom, I see your hand. I second. And Karen, I saw your physical hand just a moment too late. Uh, okay, does anybody want to make any comments or suggested changes to the minutes that were uh, distributed? Janet? Um, I saw a typo. I think it's a typo that changes the meaning of a sentence. Um, so um, by Nate Malloy, it's on the last paragraph of page three. And it's the second sentence and it says, Mr. Malloy explained that that it is the occupancy, occupancy based on code. And if it's too small, everything would trigger a special permit. And I think he meant 
large, but I may be wrong. So I assume the special permit would be triggered by a larger um, restaurant or facility or bar. So that's right, my- Thank you, Janet. Nate, do you agree with that revision? <clears throat> I too have a cold and a sore throat, so. Um, oh. Yeah, I think, right, the idea was that a larger occupant capacity would require a special permit. Okay, so uh, sounds like we have endorsement on that edit. Um, so uh, the motion that's on the floor, uh, we would need a friend, I would guess I would consider that a friendly amendment to have it moved with the revision as Janet just articulated. Uh, Johanna, I'm seeing you shake your head in affirmatively that you are accepting that amendment to the motion. And um, I already forgot who was second, who seconded. Tom, Tom. Are you, you good with that too? All right, I see you I'm shaking your head. With that. All right, good. Are there any other comments on the minutes? All right, I don't see any. So in that case, why don't we go ahead and vote on the motion to accept the minutes with the one uh, revision as Janet described. Uh, we'll do a regular roll call vote, starting with Bruce. Aye. And Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. It passes unanimously seven in favor. Thank you all. Okay, so we'll move on to the second item on our agenda this evening. That is public comment period. The time now is 6.39. Uh, I think we advertised this for 6.30, well, before 6.35. So we're not ahead of schedule. Um, I guess at this time, it sounds in the last few meetings, people have appreciated having the public attendees read in, uh, for the, so that they knew who else was present. Uh, so I will read the public attendees at this time. And then uh, if the public members who wanna make a comment would raise their hand, I can call on them in order. Uh, in addition to Amherst Media, I see Bruce Allen, Chris Chamberlain from Berkshire Design, Deborah Neubauer, uh, someone with the, let's say, abbreviation or shortening that's E-R-D-E-C, ERDEC, uh, Grace Kilpatrick, Mara Keen, and someone who has given only their first name, Rob. All right, so that's it. We have eight public attendees, including Amherst Media. Do any of you want to make a public comment on something that is not on tonight's agenda? All right, I don't see any hands. I haven't seen any hands through that reading of the names. So I will consider that topic closed. Uh, public, you may make, make comments later on topics that we are on the agenda. Nate, I see your hand. What would you like to say? <clears throat> Sorry, I was going to bring us back to the minutes. The um, so I was just rereading that paragraph um, that Janet had mentioned, and the way it reads is, is you know, Bruce had asked, "How is the two hundred and fifty occupancy limit or threshold determined?" And so that paragraph, I was saying, you know, it says, "Mr. Moy explained that it, it is the occup occupancy based on code, and if it is too small, I think." That's correct. Everything would, would trigger a special permit. I think um, it's not that the code changes. It's if our occupant, if that number two hundred and fifty is too small, you know, then any restaurant, you know, almost any restaurant, you know, say we say oh. it was one hundred and fifty, then a lot of places would trigger a special permit. And so it wasn't that, you know. I think it's just so you this, wanted to make the the minimum threshold for that special category large enough. Right. To avoid having to have the special permit apply to most institutions. Correct. Right. So I think it was just, you know, a slight rewording. Like if, you know, the 200, if we say if, if the occupancy threshold is too small, everything would trigger a special permit. I think if we inserted that into it, then it would read, you know, it, it would make sense. Okay. Um, 
All right. So, so if the it were replaced by occupancy threshold, right, then the sentence would be clearer. Yes. And we would understand that in fact the small is in fact the intention. Right. Okay. So so Chris, do you agree that I should probably go through and do another roll call since this is we're gonna revote on this? Do you need another motion to go back and reconsider? Well, I'm happy to make one. Uh, I'll, I will move that we go back and reconsider the vote we just took on the minutes and uh, the editing that was initially proposed and approved. Uh, does anybody second that motion? Tom, I see your hand. Second. Thank you, Tom. So since we have the motion to reconsider, I guess we'll have to vote on that and then we'll need to go back and vote on the minutes. Okay. So let's go through another call. I'll start at the end this time, uh, alphabetically. Karen, are you in favor of reconsidering? Yes, I. Okay. Thank you. And Johanna. I. And Janet. I. And Andrew. I. Tom. I. Bruce. I. All right, and I'm an I as well, seven in favor. And then now uh, I'll let somebody else make the initial motion. Um, I don't need to make too many in this meeting. Um, that we accept the minutes with the revised, with the edit that Nate Malloy just proposed, that we edit the originally drafted minutes by changing the it to the words occupancy threshold in that sentence at the bottom of page three. Tom, you got there first. So moved. And Bruce. Second. Thank you. All right, any further discussion? <clears throat> All right, so we'll go uh, again from the end. Karen. Aye. Thank you. Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Tom. Aye. And Bruce. Aye. Thank you all. All right. Mr. Marshall, are you an I as well? I am an I as well. Thank you. All right. So uh, we finished the first two items on the agenda. The time is 6.45 and we'll move on to item three, which is a special permit public hearing. And uh, this permit, this, this hearing is continued from September 7th of 2022. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 2023-02 from Bruce Allen for 51 Spalding Street, public hearing to request a special permit to modify ZBA FY 2007-00030 and allow three roomers within an owner-occupied dwelling unit construct five parking spaces previously approved and construct two additional parking spaces within the front setback in the northwest corner of the parcel and relocate an existing shade tree within the front setback under sections 3.3210, 5.0100, and 7.000 of the zoning bylaw. Map 14B, parcel 110 in the RG zoning district. Uh, are there any board member disclosures uh, for the continuation of this hearing? I do not see any. Uh, I welcome Chris Chamberlain back uh, from Berkshire Design. I see Bruce Allen. Uh, and uh, I believe Jason, uh, well, I actually, never mind. Uh, Jason Skeels is here, but I'm not sure you're here for this particular topic. Okay. Uh, 
Chris or Bruce, would you like to start off? Sure. Um, so when uh, last we met, um, we presented uh, this site plan uh, and special permit application um, for uh, a modification of a special permit that was granted um, uh, quite a while ago uh, that allowed a two-family house on this lot. Um, since that time, uh, the construction uh, uh, that applied to that house uh, proceeded differently than the plan that was on record. Um, and additionally, uh, the owners have been taking rumors, which is allowed by right, uh, but wasn't necessarily included in the original um, special permit. Um, and uh, but the big uh, biggest uh, portion of the site uh, was a parking lot that was not built, um, which had led to some parking issues on the street. Um, and so the site plan that we presented uh, provided seven parking spaces, uh, which meets all of the zoning criteria. Um, after a lengthy discussion about that site plan, uh, there was interest from the board in seeing a revised plan that provided just six parking spaces, which it seems like the, the board members uh, felt were adequate for the uh, residency situation in this house. Um, and so we have submitted a revised plan that shrinks that uh, parking lot by one space and also by quite a lot of impervious area, um, primarily because when, well, actually, let me share my screen so I don't have to uh, sure. draw a picture with my words as to what I'm talking about. Um, so this is the revised site plan. Um, you'll recall previously, uh, there was a series of five parking spaces in this location and a large mass of compacted gravel um, what we've done is taken advantage of sort of the, the section of the zoning code that applies to parking areas uh, that says that uh, for parking areas of five or more, uh, we need to create an in and out driveway with adequate space to turn around. Uh, that does not apply to a parking area of four spaces. And so instead, uh, we've been able to significantly shrink down the area of the parking uh, we are proposing uh, now to do this with uh, asphalt, which is a little bit more reasonable uh, given the size of this parking lot. Uh, and so we've now uh, provided the four parking spaces here, two at this end location, and two in uh, parallel parking spaces in this portion of the driveway, which happens to be um, how uh, this driveway has been uh, working at different times, although not with uh, formalized spaces along this property line, uh, and we're continuing to propose two parking spaces here for a total of six, uh, which uh, we believe uh, is uh, in accordance with sort of where the board was leaning uh, when we met last time. Um, because we've uh, pulled back a significant area of this imperviousness, uh, we're now fully outside of the 25-foot buffer, um, and it was intrusion into that 25 foot buffer that required uh, some native shrubs to be planted uh, in this location. And then we also had uh, some shrubbery uh, along this line to sort of screen against headlights uh, shining onto a property up here. Uh, so we've uh, proposed to eliminate that planting um, so that much to uh, Carol and Bruce's uh, delight, they're gonna continue to have this green space and backyard here. Uh, we did look at a couple other configurations for this parking area, um, and I know staff comments suggested that it might work better if these spaces were rotated to create head-in spaces in this location here. But what's not reflected on this survey is that there is uh, an existing tree, about a 30-foot tree, in this location. I think that came up during our discussion last time uh, that we'd really like to not remove um, and so in order to do that, we'd really have to push this pavement way back into this green space, which is exactly what we were trying to pull back from. Um, so with that, again, I think that that was the primary <laughs> sort of piece of homework that we had. Um, uh, so that's what we brought back. I'm happy to take Thank you. Questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, Bruce or Carol, are, is there anything you would like to say? No, I think Chris has summed that up correctly. All right, thank you. So, um, Chris Brestrup, uh, 
we had, I believe, two items to uh, approve, or you know, the request was for for two items. One was for the site plan, and what uh, the other was to uh, approve the existing uh, use of the house as a two family with uh, with the three borders. As I and do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I just would look to Nate Malloy to make sure that that encompasses the whole um, project because he's really been the one who's been focusing on this. All right, I will look to you, Nate. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, in terms of the uses, Doug, that that was it. Um, you know, a, a two family with rumors. Um, there were draft conditions and findings submitted. And I think with those that can also address, um, you know, any parking or site related issues. Um, you know, Bruce did comment that the removal or relocation of the tree out front. Um, he met with uh, the owner met with Alan Snow, the town's tree warden, and determined it was it's not within the right of way, so it's not a street tree anymore. Um, you know, we you know that wasn't confirmed before the hearing. Um, and then you know, there's also the possibility of some waiver requests uh, because the zoning bylaw only re you know requires um, two cars within the front setback, and so these spaces four, five, and six would be three spaces. So even on a you know in a driveway, we would, the bylaw doesn't allow for an exception. Um, so that's, you know, would be something to consider. Uh, and staff has talked about, you know, having screening or something along the southern property boundary. And so, you know, if, if there is um, a condition that there be a fence along this and it, um, you know, is within the front setback area, then it may, you know, there may need, may need to be a waiver if it's over you know, if it's six feet or over four feet, right? So if it, depending on the height of the fence. So, you know, um, those are things that to consider, but in terms of the uses, you know, it's an existing two family and, they had, and you know, they're requesting to add up to three rumors. So they take some rumors now and it's to confirm that they can have up to three um, within the number of parking spaces. Right. Okay, so you had said that there were draft conditions, uh, and I thought I saw those at one point, but are those in the packet? They are, they're online. All right. May I also say something um, in addition? Yes, Chris. Which is that I think the board needs to um, acknowledge and approve the layout of the interior of the house, which is different from what was originally approved in the special permit, in the original special permit. Right. So do, Chris, do we need to do each of those things in order or uh, each separately, I, I assume? That's probably a good idea, yep. All right, yeah, here's the draft findings. All right. Um, oh, may I say one more thing? Yeah. Which is that I think there's a fence shown on the plan, but I think didn't we receive a document from Bruce Allen that said they don't want to put a fence in, they want to put shrubbery along that southern property line. So maybe that's uh, something that needs to be clarified. Uh, Mr. Allen, do you have anything to say to uh, that? Yeah, well, I can jump in. Uh, I just want to say, while these symbols may appear to be a fence, these are actually stake marks from when the surveyors went to um, survey the property line. So that's not intended to represent a fence and none of these notes refer to a fence. So okay. I guess the question would be then, is there any proposal to put shrubbery or any type of planting along that front or along that Southern property line? And so I'll, I'll defer to Bruce on conversations that he's had with one of the abutters to the south because that happened after we put this plan together and so we did not uh, get a chance to show that. Okay. Mr. Allen? Oh. Am I speaking? How do I raise my hand? You're, You're on. on. You're on. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Um, of course, the lot uh, to the, to, on the bottom of the screen is vacant. It's a quarter acre lot, so it'll never be built on. Uh, the next person over is, is that... Uh, 45 Spalding, and she has her a, a she has a home based business, and she has a workshop, pretty much uh, right about uh, where the, the parking area is, and she has two windows there which look out over the greenery, and her her thing was that she, she really enjoys our yard, she loves the greenery and all that, 
And uh, we had told her, and she likes the plantings we already have along the southern, uh, the southern line there. Uh, and we told her we would probably add in some arborvitae here and there to complements what, what is there now. And she said that, that would, she would really like that. And but she also expressed a very negative opinion about having any kind of stockade fence there or anything like that, because she said it would ruin her view. And she literally kind of looks this way all day long, uh, five days a week, and her, her and her workers. Uh, so uh, she was really adamant about not, not, having a, not having a fence there. All right. So um, the arborvitae that you mentioned as a potential planting, would that happen on your parcel at 51 or would it be on the adjacent parcel? No, it's, it will be uh, in, this, in the strip there where you see the, uh, the wattles, the erosion control barriers, uh, and then it will follow the driveway around. We already have uh, significant plantings there now, uh, but they're not necessarily plantings which are, um, they're not green in the winter time. Uh, and our intention is to, uh, it, uh, because we have to raise up the southern boundary just a little bit to get the driveway level. I mean, we're not level, but get the driveway so it's level on a, you know, on a left to right basis. Um, we won't know exactly where we want to put the arborvitaes uh, because we also have these trees here until we get the driveway in and we can figure out the best spots to put these. All right. Um, Nate, uh, since this property is coming under a special permit, uh, do, do all plantings that are added to this plan have to be permitted? Well, I think if it's mentioned that there's gonna be plantings here, you know, that we could either have a revised plan or have something here, you know, number of plantings and possibly size as a condition that you know they could come back at a public meeting to finalize the plantings on the southern boundary but i think it should be something that is incorporated as a condition all right uh bruce and carol you have any objection to coming back and clarifying the plantings uh, i don't have a problem I'm, with that but yeah, I'm not sure. not. that would have to be after we put the driveway in though yes okay uh, yeah. Chris Chamberlain. Yeah, I, I was just curious if it's possible to handle it with with a condition. Uh, if there's a certain number that Bruce is agreeable to, uh, certainly if they don't mind coming back, uh, I'm not going to object on their behalf. But um, anything right. to simplify the process. Yeah, I guess that's what I was hoping to do. Uh, Janet. So. On the draft conditions, condition six um, refers to planting. So I think we could just be more specific and say, you know, X number of arborvitae along the southern edge yeah. in property line. Because really the plan doesn't have any plantings right now. There is no new planting. So that language in six doesn't quite make sense. Right. Right. And sometimes in the past, the condition has read that the applicant shall return at a public meeting to present the final landscape plan. Um, so there could be something uh, with some follow-up there. Okay. All right. Um, so why don't we continue with the site plan and uh, try to get through that first. <clears throat> uh, so board members, uh, I guess I'm interested in your thoughts about this revised site plan. And uh, if you want to indicate some level of uh, comfort or acceptance with it, uh, then we kind of have a sense of where we're going with this. Bruce, I see your hand first. Um, I have a higher level of comfort, a much higher level of comfort than I did last time. I remember my concern last time, uh, which was driving me towards wanting to condition or uh, push for five only parking spaces was the size of the parking area originally as it consumed the existing lawn at the rear. Uh, and mostly I was concerned, not so much for the current occupants, but uh, you may recall my concern was that this would create a very unusual landscapes feature for a house, which would probably drive it firmly into the student market uh, 
a student rental market uh, full on, I was thinking. That, that just seemed to me that we were inviting that kind of use. And I thought that that was not a good uh, um, situation to be encouraging in a residential area. Well, this uh, revised uh, plan um, solves that completely, I think. Uh, I mean, one could still push for f five instead of uh, six spaces, but it it wouldn't affect the plan. I mean, the plan, the, the paving ex extent and arrangement of the paving is shown if we were to uh, advocate for five spaces. I don't think it would change a square meter of, uh, of the paving layout. So I think this is, uh, take, uh, has satisfied my concerns for the uh, future of this property in this neighborhood. Um, and uh, that's probably for me the most important thing. I mean, there are a few other comments I could make, um, but for me, I think for the moment, it's a, it's a, it's a vast improvement and it really uh, brings it back into uh, uh, conformity with the, what I would think was, was a reasonable uh, uh, site arrangement for a residential, uh, a two family residence in, in this area. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Karen, you are, you are next. Yeah, I, I agree uh, totally with Bruce. I think this is really, I'm, I'm very happy to see this. I'm not sure why exactly it's now asphalt, but it, it probably makes more sense to have something compact that's going to be used for the, for all this parking on that road. But, um, that it was so sad last time to see that whole backyard be parking. And uh, this is a much, and, and keeping the tree if possible, keeping that view for the neighbor, and in the same time satisfying the need to get the cars off the street uh, is very good. So yes, I, I agree, this is much better. Um, okay. And I, I applaud you for doing it. Okay, thank you, Karen. I'm Andrew. Yeah, not much more else to add. I think uh, that was a nice summary um, by my peers. The only thing I was trying to remember from uh, touring this myself is there a sidewalk on the east side or on the yeah the east side of Spalding? Uh, I don't remember any. I think it's on the I, west side. No. Yeah, correct. There's none on the east side. Okay, very good. Yeah, um, I won't use any more time. Uh, happy with the improvements. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Janet. Oh, Janet, your hand was up. Oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. I didn't, um, so my two questions are: what are the, what will the erosion control barriers consist of? Are they going to be like wood, or and then how will the cars in spaces one and two exit? Are you expecting them to just back up, or can they do a three point turn? Okay, let's ask uh, that question of Chris Chamberlain. Sure. Um, so the first one's real simple. We do have a detail here that this is a uh, straw wattle, the the tubes of straw staked in place um, with this, uh, which is this entire heavy dashed line, sort of surrounding the limit of disturbance in both locations, um, and that's included on the plan that we submitted. Um, and yes, the um, the. The intention with this plan is that spaces one and two would need to back out. Um, as I was talking about earlier, the only way to feasibly get a turnaround here would be to extend this drive. Let me say, the only feasible way to get a turnaround in and preserve this tree that's not shown on the plan would be to extend this driveway quite a ways um, into the backyard and create a much larger mass of pavement. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there have been times where there have been up to four cars in the driveway in the existing condition where we don't have the formalized spaces or the same width of pavement, um, and it's been adequate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Janet, I hope that satisfies your questions. All right, so uh, I guess the uh, one comment I would like to make is that uh, I know the conversation started off focused on the site plan, uh, but uh, I wanted to give everybody a chance to 
make sure that uh, the, the interior uh, layout of the house and the number of occupants that are uh, contained in it uh, under the configuration that is being proposed that we approve, that does influence the number of parking spaces that are proposed. So uh, if you want to have a conversation about the interior of the house, I'm, I'm actually thinking maybe we should settle that before we approve the parking. So uh, Bruce, do you have any thoughts about that? I have a question. I, I really, it's a, just to confirm an understanding. Uh, do I correctly understand that the uh, uh, the the, uh, the the draft condition that uh, um, says three rumors that that the three rumors are in addition to the uh, uh, any occupants in the apartment? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So it's a two-family. It's it's. It's a, a two family or a two, two unit building. Um, one is an efficiency apartment and the other one is the main body of the house plus bedroom six. Uh, as I recall, this, the, the main body of the house had four bedrooms in it and, and number six made it a fifth bedroom. And uh, the owner said they intended to let out Bed, uh, bedroom number six and two of the four bedrooms on the second floor of the main house, retaining two bedrooms for their own use. Yes, I just wanted to make sure that that original statement was uh, uh, that, that the draft condition was uh, kind of in line with that and, and, and the answer is that it is. Um, so I, I know that the apartment is a very small um, a piece uh, of real estate. Uh, and I think that the draft conditions stipulate that it shall um, have only one, uh, th that the occupants of that apartment shall, uh, shall bring only one car onto the site. And uh, providing that condition is, uh, is um, maintained or established, I, I think that uh, that the arrangement and so forth uh, works and uh, it fits with the six uh, spaces that uh, are shown on the plan. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Janet. Um, I think they have six bedrooms in the main house. That's why it's called bedroom six. And um, I think there were con there was four bedrooms on the second floor and they're converting one some study space into a bedroom. The the owners have a bedroom on the first floor. All right. So, yeah, I think so. So, um, so I'm concerned about bedroom six because um, it you know it seems to me that several neighbors have said that it's basically operating as a separate unit, which it's you know if it it's supposed to be a a two family and if it's if it's actually operating as a separate unit where the person isn't really using the rest of the house that um you know would violate the um the bylaw as well as being kind of unsafe if that place isn't properly fireproofed and such and so there has been testimony that by the owners that you know the person in the tenant in that unit happens to always eat all their meals at UMass and yet there's also testimony or statements by the people who did the site visit that they have a refrigerator and a microwave and some neighbors have seen bags, that person bringing, bringing in bags and bags of food. So it seems to me like, my question is like, I don't know what's going on with bedroom six or the renter there, but it seems like it is operating as an apartment, a separate apartment, not you know the border using the main kitchen or eating out. And so I would like to see a condition that you know, no, you know, like no microwave or refrigerators be allowed in that unit. I think it's two rooms. And so it won't be operating as a sort of separate unit. And then it would be a boarding house where there's just one kitchen and just have a, just that the, you know, the, the occupants can, the boarders cannot be, you know, basically using hot plates or microwaves or convection ovens or refrigerators or, you know, storing, you know, bags and bags of food. So. All right, Janet. Um, I will say that we, Rob Mora was pretty clear uh, at the last time we met that this is not an apartment. It does not meet the state's state definition of an apartment. 
Um, so I don't think we can really make our determination on, uh, you know, make calling it an apartment. Um, Karen. You know, there are rooms and dormitories at UMass that have, I think, microwaves uh, in that. I think that if this um, unit has a microwave and refrigerator, that's, I, I think it would be a shame to have to take that out. Um, I don't think that's heavy cooking. And students that eat meals, they still, it's nice if they can warm up a, um, some soup in a microwave. I don't, I, I, I think uh, that that's fine and it's not a kitchen or a separate apartment. So uh, I kind of disagree with Janet. I think one should just allow it. Okay, thank you. I will say that this conversation reminds me of my junior year in college when I lived in a single dormitory room but had a hot plate uh, and a refrigerator in my room. Um, and so I, I didn't take 21 meals at the, uh, the uh, dining hall and uh, nobody really felt like I was living in an apartment all of a sudden and I certainly didn't. Uh, Janet. So, you know, I should have prefaced my remarks by, I really think it's great that people have students staying in their house. It's a great way for Amherst, the town to absorb you know, all these students, um, it's a great way for income. It's a great way to create a different kind of community with, you know, the, the students and the locals. I think that when we're talking about a boarding house or having, you know, boarders, you know, and you read the um, definitions and you read the bylaw, you're talking about everybody's using a common kitchen. And so if somebody has some leftover food, I'm sure the other boarders who are upstairs just come down and use the kitchen and heat it up. It's kind of like a shared household. And so I think that you know, maybe we're not hitting the technical definition, but, you know, if this person is washing dishes, has all sorts of ways to heat and cook food, has a refrigerator, then it's actually basically operating as an apartment and should meet code, or at least it should be safer, or it's not a border, but it's really kind of a, a separate tenant. And so I think we don't want to encourage kind of these sort of, you know, half legal units with all sorts of heating and refrigeration without actually you know, saying these are separate units. So I just, I do, you know, I do want to encourage, you know, I think it's fantastic that people have students staying with them. I just think that this is kind of crossing into a gray area. And if we just condition that the person can't be cooking in their room, they can just go upstairs and use the microwave or the refrigerator. It's not a hardship. All right. Thank you, Janet. Chris? I just wanted to reiterate me. Are you talking about me or Chris Chamberlain? I am talking about you, Chris Prestrup. Okay. So I just wanted to reiterate what Nate said. Rob Mora has toured every room in this house. He's seen it in its existing condition. And he does not believe that room bedroom number six is a separate dwelling unit. It only has one room, although it does have an alcove that contains a refrigerator, a microwave, and a sink. But Rob Mora is the zoning enforcement officer, and he knows the building code backward and forward, as well as the zoning bylaw, and he does not think that bedroom number six is a separate dwelling unit. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, I don't see any more hands. Um, maybe I'll take this opportunity to just ask if there are any of the members of the public that would like to uh, make a comment at this time. Uh, let's see, Pam, could you bring Rebecca Cornell in and let her make a comment? Uh, Ms. Cornell, if you could uh, give us your name and your address, please. Good evening. My name is Rebecca DeCorsi Cornell. My family lives at 60 Spalding Street. We also own the vacant lot next to um, this property. Um, first thing I want to caution you of is just remember there's a serious, this is, there's, there's pretty serious history of noncompliance from this person. Please do not accept um, them saying that the, they'll, they may plant arborvitaes, they may do this, they may do that, they won't. They didn't back in 2009 when they were supposed to. Um, Chris Chamberlain, do you have any details of the driveway adjacent the vacant lot? 
Mr. Chamberlain. The uh, by details, meaning like a cross section or right. So there's a three foot drop there as proposed. Um, it won't work. Um, I think that I would ask the planning board to request that to understand what's going to happen there, as is that that land is already eroding onto our property. Um, there are certain standards that need to be met and adhered to. Um, as I stated in my last letter, we have a serious problem with these people trespassing and harassing us. I am asking the, um, the planning board to put a fence down, just a split rail fence, that's affordable, not ugly, down the property line so we can demarcate this problem and have it end. Um, Arborvitaeus is also not the correct species to plant right next to a parking space. They grow on average at least 12 to 24 inches a year. If they plant Arborvitaeus there, they will grow over those parking spaces and will end up with the same problem. So I would ask that you really um, consider that because this is a long time coming. I mean, this isn't a, this was an easy problem that should have been solved a long time ago. Um, and I, my main concern with use is there's no enforcement. For 13 years, I have been trying to get the town to address this and put in parking. And over and over and over, I was told they were doing nothing wrong. I think it's pretty obvious that they were. And I'm asking for you guys to correct a problem that the town made. Um, limit the number of bedrooms. There's, there's no way that you can enforce that they're not going to rent out all the bedrooms. And even right now, they're renting out a bedroom that in this last meeting, they said they weren't. Um, just... I, I want, could you articulate what you're, what you're saying there? You, you, which bedroom do you think they're renting out that they're not? And how would you even know that? Um, because you can see it from the street. They're renting one of the front bedrooms. All right. Any further comments? Your three minutes are just about up. Not at this time. All right. Thank you. All right, I do not see any other uh, comments or uh, rate hands raised from the public. Uh, are there any other public members who would like to make a comment? All right, um, Chris Brestrup, I had a question for you uh, or maybe for Nate, since I keep forgetting that Nate's the point person on this. Um, the uh, owner, owner, occupancy condition. Um, I assume that would survive uh, the sale of the property. Yes, <clears throat> you could condition it. Um, but you know, the as a two family, we could have it be required that it remain owner occupied. Um, you know, when this was originally permitted, the zoning was different, right? So it required a special permit from the ZBA. And now uh, it wouldn't. This would be a site plan review use, not a special permit use. And so, um, I mean, I guess it is a, a discussion for the board about how you want to um, condition. Well, part, part, of what I'm, part of what I'm wondering is whether, uh, you know, whether we would, whether we have the right or the ability to allow the current proposed use uh, with the three borders and the efficiency apartment, uh, but have it terminate at the sale of the property so that you know we sort of reset when we have a, a new set of owners who may not want to do, you know, may not want to operate it in quite the same way. And uh, that would give us all a chance to kind of reconsider how it's been working whether the neighbors are still up in arms or whether things have settled down um, and uh, just, uh, you know, whether that's something we could do. Right, so <clears throat> it would have to be owner occupied to be continued to use the way they're proposing. Um, the final condition, number 22 said upon change of ownership, the new owner shall appear at a public meeting to review an updated management plan, parking plan, and complaint response plan. And so, you know, a future owner doesn't necessarily have to use this as a rumor, rooming house, right? So they, they don't have to continue it, um, even if there's a permit on the property, so. Right, I'm actually wondering whether we can sunset the allowance of the borders and, the, and uh, with the 
with the sale of the property and that you come back and we start from zero again. So that, that has been a condition in the past, but uh, with the zoning board, it's not something that uh, is typical now, just because, you know, if there's complaints or problems, then it's an enforcement action. And then, you know, the permit may need to be updated. So, you know, they used to have that condition um, thinking that, you know, the change of ownership was a chance to rectify things, but typically they get, you know, they can be fixed, you know, without, a you know, if there's a problem that's notified and, and, you know, it may require a change to the special permit anyways, whether right. it's a owner or a new so, owner. So if there are problems uh, that, that continue and uh, could we revoke some of the, you know, some of the permission for the number of borders or that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I guess if there's a, so with the conditions, we're saying that there'd be, you know, demarcated uh, parking spaces that the that the occupants of the property park off the street. And if so that if that becomes something where there is consistent complaints, then, you know, it may be that it has to come back to the board um, to determine that, you know, does something need to be changed there? Right. All right. Well, I just kind of wanted to put that on the table. Uh, since uh, this is a pretty unusual situation and I, I'd be surprised if later owners or at least later owner occupants really want to do the same thing. Uh, Bruce. Um, I want to actually follow up on the abutters uh, uh, observation slash question. Um, uh, I don't know whether the plan can be brought up uh, for two reasons. One is I wasn't sure where we were talking about screening and so forth and uh, butters because uh, the, the, the uh, attendee said that they were in a butter, but I didn't know on what side. Uh, but first of all, uh, I think the comment about uh, the driveway not working uh, without some kind of retaining wall or something was something I was going to ask uh, uh, as we moved on here. The uh, southern boundary there, that, uh, which I guess is the one with the erosion control barrier that runs right along those uh, stakes that are not a fence. Um, and, and I guess it's right against trees that are there. Uh, those, they're existing trees, as I recall, uh, Chris, is that correct? Chris uh, Chamberlain. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. So uh, how does the grade work in a cross section from the house, uh, kind of a, a north south section um, where the number parking number four and parking number three are right there? What's the drop off? I mean, I can see that the, uh, the, 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 the topography there, which I guess is the existing topo, um, indicates that uh, can you bank that I mean you're right on the property line so you can't kind of grade it off into the neighbor you do have trees there uh, how is this affecting those trees uh, can you uh, speak to uh, the, uh, the, the 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 challenges of doing work right up against the property line where you have trees sure so first I'll highlight that our edge of pavement is a little over three feet off of the property line so it's not directly against it there okay um, so and we are showing um, proposed contours um, if we compare the existing to proposed we're looking at the edge of pavement uh, so I should say in the existing condition uh, you can see say an existing contour here uh, with a little hinge point, which reflects sort of where the uh, landscape starts to roll away. Yeah. Um, and so as Bruce mentioned, there is a little bit of fill. You, you can estimate, say at this point, that there's about four inches of fill um, yeah. to bring that up to uh, flatter grade, again, about three feet off of the property line. Okay, so, I mean, I know you from, uh, and I know Berkshire Design as a firm for 30 or more years, and I know that uh, the, the world around you have come to trust your professional capabilities. So uh, I would expect that when you show me something like this, that you are satisfied that uh, as a professional uh, uh, engineer, that this is, uh, this, is, this design is going to stand up, it's going to stand the test of time. Um, 
and I, I would like you to reassure me that uh, that that understanding uh, that, that I'm safe in 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 persisting with that understanding of your uh, firm's design uh, capabilities here. This is a this grading and this edge uh, is sound, and the trees are in. Um, uh, and the health of the trees is not threatened. Uh, would you attest to that? Um, the yes, uh, like I say, the the amount of fill that we're looking at at this uh, edge of pavement is is pretty modest. Um, there's room to work between there and the property line. Um, I uh, I would say that you know there's going to need to be some care um, in working around here. Um, but in the existing condition, um, we have a driveway that's intruding on the drip line of these trees as it is. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I think that if, uh, you know, if we wanted to add, uh, you know, additional um, conditions uh, in terms of the tree protection, which is stated, but, uh, you know, maybe not um, clearly delineated, um, that, uh, you know, we can... Um, include our requirement to um, bring an arborist out while that gravel base is being laid to ensure that the roots are taken care of um, in an appropriate way. Um, if that would uh, help reassure that we're going to be um, careful in this zone here. I'm, I imagine the owners would want that as well. So I'm, I'm probably going to trust that the uh, property owners' interests are going to be enough to drive the safety of the trees. Final question. Um, the uh, commenting about I mentioned the stockade fence along the boundary. Uh, uh, did you understand which boundary uh, she was proposing the fence be constructed? Um, so I under that understand that to mean this property line here. Okay. And that's the property line that the uh, the the applicants said that the abato was happy to look at something other than a fence. So I'm confused about uh, two people so, claiming that they're about us. Yeah, I, I think I can clarify that is um, the the um, a butter that was just speaking is the owner of the vacant lot here. And the butter that Bruce was speaking about is the person on the next property down, which is then the first house south of this land. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bruce. Karen, you are next. Thank you. Um, I think that this driveway addresses the main concern of, of the people on the street that the street be not blocked by the cars that belong to this house. So this is a way to rectify that. Um, and I think there were also many comments from neighbors that said, that this house is beautifully maintained and that these are neighbors who uh, care for their property. So um, what, what you were talking about, Doug, uh, of sort of maybe making sure that if this house is sold, that the next people don't, they might not, they might be owners who are renting out, but not of the quality of these people. So I, I am a little bit concerned that um, that if we grant this permit, that it will work fine, but what happens when the house is sold? So I think we should consider a condition that this is just for the present owners and that maybe if it's possible that you start from scratch uh, another time because this is such an unusual thing. All right, thank you, Karen. Janet. Um, I had a separate issue, which was our question. So in the draft condition 22, it, um, it says upon a change of ownership, the new owner shall appear at a public meeting in the planning board to review an updated management plan, parking plans and complaint response plan. And um, I, do we have a complaint response plan that's been submitted? Or is that just sort of boilerplate? Because I think one of the concerns of um, Ms. Cornell is that she has been complaining and no one's responding. And so 
is there a, a complaint response plan that's been submitted and I just missed it or? All right. Why don't we ask uh, either Chris Brestrup or Nate Malloy? Do we have that? I don't remember seeing it in the packet. Hi, Doug. So um, a previous condition reference that the owners would keep um, number condition 19, the owner shall maintain a log of complaints filed with the um, the owner, manager, or town, and uh, document actions taken in response to it. Um, so it's something that isn't you know available now. It's something that we would we're recommending as a condition, um, right. just so that they're you know so you know <laughs> if, if there's a new owner, they would have that log and they would present it. Okay. All right, uh, Janet. I assume that answers your question. All right. Um, I think that will satisfy Ms. Cornell, though. I, you know, their their concerns about not having complaints dealt with. But I guess that's right. more with the town. Well, uh, you know, obviously some of the complaint they've had with the way things have gone have been with the town. Um, but uh, I think they've also been unhappy with some of the actions of the owner. Uh, Chris, did you want to speak? I just wanted to clarify something, and that is that um, Rebecca Cornell was requesting a split rail fence, which is um, only about four feet high. It has posts every six to eight feet, and it's see-through. So it's not the stockade fence that Bruce mentioned. I just wanted to clarify that. I'm not advocating for a split rail fence, but I wanted to give you a sense that it was really something that's transparent, if you will, and not doesn't block a view. Okay, thank you. All right, so board members, uh, are we ready to vote on this site plan? And if so, if somebody's ready to vote, maybe they could make a motion that we uh, end discussion and uh, move to a vote on this site plan. Bruce, I see your hand. Um. The, uh, the vote would be based on uh, the conditions and so forth. If that's the case, then I'm thinking, wouldn't, wouldn't, shouldn't we review the findings and the conditions uh, systematically so that we can edit those if we choose? Because that will allow us, for example, to combine uh, conditions six and seven uh, or, or delete seven if we choose, because that's got the fence requirement or, uh, suggested and we could add some d data about the tree which uh, uh, Chris I, Chamberlain had suggested. So I'm thinking that I would prefer to review the draft condition list and see if we can't sharpen them up to a point where um, they don't okay. have to come back. That sounds like a good suggestion. So uh, I'm given my voice, I'm gonna ask someone else to, to be reading our draft findings and conditions this evening. Um, does anybody wanna volunteer to do that? Or maybe just, agree to do the first page and then we'll move on to someone else. Chris, is that you volunteering? I can do it because Nate is um, suffering from the same thing you're suffering from. Mm -hmm. So I can start off and then maybe somebody else can pick it up. If my fails. Well, thanks, um, Chris. So you want to so do I was the- gonna I was gonna jump in quickly. Um, would it make sense to still get the conditions first? Sometimes it's a little out of order, but they may, they may you know, then um, impact the findings just because we're, you know, we have some conditions about how the rooms would be used or lease conditions. Um, All right. That's All fine. right, so, so we'd start on the uh, bottom of page two with the draft conditions. And Doug, I'm happy to follow Chris at uh, any point. All right. Okay, draft conditions, um, I'll put my hand down. Um, condition number one, the property shall contain no more than the existing two units and provide for provide rooms for up to three roomers. Is that okay? Um, number two, the property shall provide a template lease for the second dwelling unit and for each rooming unit to the building commissioner. I don't know if the word template is necessary there, but I think that what you do want is a lease for those, um, those units and rooms. Okay. Well, I, I assume the word template is there to de denote a, a document which would be called a lease that has not been executed by anyone. So um, you prefer to leave that so, word in there, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think if you took it out, the the owner could simply deliver the executed lease that they had with each rooming unit to the building commissioner, and it would be however they agreed to make it. Okay. I, I wonder if you would want a signed lease. I don't know what a template. I don't know what a template lease is, other than it could be a draft lease. Yeah. Well, Chris, what's so, yeah, the, the, what's the, the purpose of this? If it's not, you know, it's not. Nobody's reviewing it. It's simply, here's what we do. Um, is this something that anyone would comment on and <coughs> ask for changes or not? It gives yeah, the think... building commissioner something to enforce. So, uh, if something's in the lease and he has a copy of it, then he can enforce what's in the lease. All right. So it should and, be an executed lease. And or or and would it be the same, you know, same document and conditions and obligations for all of the, you know, all of them, or they maybe vary from one to the next, like the efficiency unit needs to have only one car and the maybe rumor number three only can't have any cars for all we know. So um I mean if it's an executed lease, it probably does it need to happen every year? It would need to happen every year if it were an executed lease. And I don't know if the building commissioner wants to be receiving right. what essentially would be four leases every year. So I think probably the idea is that if the building commissioner has the wording of a lease, and maybe there are two leases, one for the second unit and one for each rooming unit, but he has them on file so he knows what can be enforced. All right. Well, that, that certainly makes sense to me rather than doing it every year. Um, but we are talking about four different documents, one for the second dwelling unit and one for each rumor. Yep. Although you could have one for the second dwelling unit and then one that would apply for each rumor. Assuming the conditions are all the same. Yeah. I would assume that they would be for each rumor. Well, yeah, but we don't not. we don't really know. Mm -hmm. You know, get, particularly given how different bedroom six is. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess it, I mean it doesn't matter to me if it's an executed one or not, but you know they're going to have the the template available before they execute them. So if there's if it needs to be a timely delivery, then I would leave the template in. Okay. Right. This condition has been used before by the zoning board, and so sometimes, you know, the template at least also provides time for the building commissioner to review it to make sure it complies with you know say conditions of a site plan review or special permit as well. So Bef before issuing you know a permit. Right. But there's no permit being issued in this case. No, but the building permit. Well, there's no building happening. But there would be a rental permit. OK. All right. Proceed. I guess. Condition three, bedroom six, as shown on the plans dated June 28th, 2022, prepared by Fitch Architecture and Community to Design and reviewed by the planning board on September 7th, 2022 and October 19th, 2022, shall be maintained as an accessory rooming unit under section 5.0100 of the zoning bylaw and shall not contain a cooking appliance that establishes a full kitchen as de defined by the applicable state law. Bedroom six is on the ground floor adjacent to the efficiency unit that has its own entry egress. Is that okay? Well, I think we all agree we don't want it to qualify as a full apartment. Mm -hmm. Okay, number four, the property <clears throat> shall register with the residential rental program and shall be subject to periodical, periodic inspection as required by the code enforcement officer. Number five, all exterior lighting shall be downcast and shielded. Number six, plantings shall be installed and maintained in accordance with the approved plan. There's a parenthetical here 
this condition could specify sizes at time of planting. Um, is that something that the board wants the applicant to come back with, or do you want to establish that now? Board members, how do you feel about that? We certainly, we certainly discussed the plantings. We had a comment from a neighbor regarding the appropriateness of arborvitae. Bruce? Um, if we could uh, establish uh, simply a number of, of uh, acceptable trees uh, that were to be planted along the southern boundary. Uh, I agree that arborvitae is not a good choice if it, it can grow too high, but there are species that are dwarf and they are quite, uh, quite controllable and they won't infringe on the parking. Um, but uh, do we know we want screening? I don't know that we do. We know that the next house to the south seems, or we, we've heard that they would like to have some screening. Andrew, do you have any uh, thoughts about this? Uh, yeah, I would just say since, you know, we've heard about screening, we've heard about, you know, delineating the property that it would make sense to have them bring the plant back. I, I think that number alone is probably not satisfactory. Yeah, I guess I'm a little bit leery of getting into picking tree species and numbers uh, by committee, uh, and I'm not a particular expert in that area. Okay, uh, I'm fine, fine with that. So, uh, so, so Chris, the condition six would be, would require the applicant to re return with a final uh, proposal for plantings and screening or fencing uh, uh, at a later, but prior to, uh, you know, prior, prior to a full approval. Well, I think um, if I'm imagining this correctly, you would give your approval tonight with conditions. So we should draft this condition so that it requires them to return with the um, final plan. Um, right. And maybe that's, I think the building commissioner has to give a permit for the paving of the driveway, doesn't he? Nate or Chris Chamberlain, what do you think about that? I'm not actually sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure either since it's not a new Herb. Well, I guess there would be a driveway permit for the new spaces, so there would be um, some kind of permit action there. I think there is a permit. Yep. Okay. So, and are we giving the applicant um, the ability to choose whether to put a fence in or arborvitae? Because I agree with Rebecca Cornell that there's not enough, not really much room for plantings, but there is room for a fence, and if the if the reason for putting it there is not screening, but rather delineating the edge of the property, then maybe a fence makes more sense than planting. Well, I guess um, I don't quite understand the timing that would be required with them to come back. Um, and it sounds like there's been some concern about how prompt they were on, on dealing with things. Um, should we just continue this and have them come back with a final plan at the next meeting? We could do that. I mean, let's get a complete plan and go forward. I mean, if people feel we need to have some screening, I mean, we could just approve the plan the way it's drawn with no, no planting and no, no fencing and be okay with that. And if, if they and their neighbor, you know, if the neighbors convince them to do something different, uh, they could come back with a, with a new application. Uh, Mr. Allen, uh, I see your hand up. My concern is that we already have a number of plantings along that line, various trees. Uh, what do you call it, a U? They're, some U's. Very well established and, we have and some big trees. and supportive. And, and what will happen is, it's not until we get the driveway one that side of the driveway will probably have to come up about four inches so what we're left with after the new driveway is put in is going to have a lot to do with what we plant and where we plant it our thought had been 
would be is once the driveway's in, take a good look at it, walk, walk it around, you know, get some plantings and plant them and then take some photographs or something like that. Because right now, I would hate to put in a landscape plan that's on paper and find out that, we, that uh, you asked for, uh, for, for seven arborvitaes uh, 13 inches apart and whether we found out we couldn't put them 13 inches apart, you know, that kind of thing because of whatever is left over after the driveway is in. Um, right. So that's my concern is it's really hard to nail down exactly where you're going to put these plants uh -huh. until you actually have the driveway in. Okay, thank you. Andrew. Yeah, I, no, I remember hearing you say that before and I'm just, I'm trying to uh, figure out what would make it hard um, and that you'd have to wait. I, I, I do appreciate, you know, wanting to make sure it's done correctly, but um, I'm, I'm not totally clear on why you wouldn't be able to determine um, at this, you know, before the driveways uh, added what the plantings would need to look like. I mean, because you'll you'll have to know what the overall plan looks like even before it's installed in terms of the the, uh, the driveway, correct? You're addressing that to Mr. Allen, right? Yeah, I'm. Uh, yes, thank you, Doug. And I, uh, Chris Chamberlain, do you want to comment since you're their designer? Yeah, um, you know, I think that certain, as far as I'm concerned, that we can certainly work with Bruce and Carol um, to put a plan together. Um, you know, I would be a little concerned about um, doing a whole continuation just for the um, planting plan, not least of all because. Uh, since this is a special permit, there's an appeal period that has to go by, and I know that that Bruce is trying to uh, get contractors lined up. You know, we're going to get to a comment down below that talks about the timeline, um, which is already you know problematic for this year, um, and the way that the industry is just you know the longer and longer we push out the certainty that there is an approved plan for the hardscape, the you know the more difficult it's going to be to to hit any particular timeline. Um, so I think from my perspective, uh, we can certainly have a plan for planting um, back to the board before construction. Perhaps that could be, um, an, again, you know, driveway permit shall not be issued until kind of condition. Um, but I would sort of push against the idea that we continue the entire public hearing for that plan. All right. Thank you, Tom. Sure, I was just going to um, follow up with um, the comment in similar regard to Andrew and that I don't understand what we would need to wait for and what we would see that a designer with this kind of experience could imagine what three and a half feet of um, land could uh, accommodate. Um, and, and I think that I also read a note that um, this won't be installed until spring so we're talking about eight months so it doesn't seem like much of a rush to do it so i mean i'm I, I understand that we could complete this now and um you know have them come back um or we can have them come back in a, in a week or two with a new set of drawings but i think either way they're coming back with drawings prior to construction of the driveway so i think um you know something that we should we consider either way all right. All right. So, board members, uh, we've we've had a variety of points of view here, and um, we're going to need to decide how we want this to read, unless we want to just continue and punt to the to a later meeting. Taryn, I see your hand. Um, yeah, I wanted. We can't just drop the. Uh, the fence without talking about that a little bit, because as Chris mentioned, if you have a split rail fence, uh, it does not really sort of office, off, hinder the view as much. And it sounds as if the neighbor who's complaining across the street uh, is very adamant that her property, that there should be no trespassing, no snow, nothing on that. So she cares a lot about really delineating uh, her property. So what, how do we fee, are we get, how, I think we should decide whether that should be a condition or at least talk about it. How do you feel, Karen? I think you need to express your opinion. We need some decisions here. 
um, I wonder how Carol and Bruce feel about that. Is that something that they're really, yeah, how did they feel about that? As about for, installing a split, split rail, rail fence. fence to, in a way, uh, make peace with the neighbor across the street. And perhaps that wouldn't be so unattractive. And it, I don't think it would have to go along the whole uh, side of it. Or do they think that that's going to be ugly and they prefer not to? I'd like to hear from okay. you. All right. Um, Mr. Allen, Ms. Albano, uh, you are muted. How Our do you neighbor is concerned, is concerned about where the property line is at all times. Uh, we just spent a lot of money putting uh, survey stakes out there pretty much every 10 feet. Those survey stakes are right on the property line that go from the front all the way to the back. Those stakes are as, are as good of a marker for that property line as any fence would be, and they would probably last longer than any fence that goes in there. Secondly, uh, if you look at the topography there, we do not have any, the ground that's on our side of the property line goes up and down. So there's no real way to put a split rail fence there and a split rail fence has no real value. Now, I would offer though, if you go to the prop, the, her side of the property line, it is a straight run from the front to the back. And if, and I, if, she, if she'd like, she can put in a split rail fence herself. I don't okay. see why we need to do that. We already have it marked. We paid a lot of money to get it marked. It's currently marked. There's no reason to take out the surveys markers and put in a split rail fence. For what reason? Plus, we have a lot of nice plantings already that are mature and beautiful. And the, the other neighbor who can look in on it can see that. And, and at the very least, why would we put it all the way to the back? I mean, we're only talking about marking to the, the driveway. And, and I'm going to I'm going to say that there is, I counted it up. For 27 years, we have had four cars parking in that driveway for 27 years, and it's not been a problem. We did park kind of on the grass inside our own driveway, but so we're going to resolve all that. Now we're going to be, you know, we, we make it, we're only going one car length longer than it is. And the bottom line is we're going to have the same four cars that everybody has looked at for years and years, years. Right. And the same thing with the inside the house. My, no changes, my, my other so. comment is, is that I do not know of any zoning bylaw which requires a, a person to put up a physical indication of where a property line is. I, I, I haven't found that in the zoning regs. Right. I so think I'm not question, sure where that our idea even comes from. I understood. I think we, we want to make our house beautiful. We, we want to make it very attractive. Believe me, it's in our best interest. So want, we're not going to make it. I also ugly. want to comment your, the main complainant here is a person that only comes to this neighborhood one hour every two weeks to mow that property. And then she goes back to her other house. She never even doesn't even live here. Okay. And she's. Right. I think I think we've got your answer that you would not like to put in a fence, and uh, I think the board will take that under advisement. Thank you, um, uh, Bruce. I see your hand, but I see Chris's hand, so I want to give Chris Brestrup a chance to uh, weigh in here. I wanted to note that um, this is a special permit, and the planning board can put on conditions that it feels are reasonable, even though the Zoning bylaw itself doesn't require that someone's property line be marked with a fence. That is a reasonable condition for the planning board to impose if the planning board sees fit to do so. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bruce. Um, I, I think that we should either delete uh, um, condition, draft condition six, in other words, require no screening, or we should uh, take it as it currently stands, because I don't think, uh, 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 I mean, uh, there, the, we would be creating a, a, a landscape plan. I thought we might be able to do it, but I, I'm convinced uh, now that it might take a little bit too long. So I think that we should uh, maintain the condition as it's currently stated. Uh, we, can, uh, we can approve this uh, um, application with the uh, condition that uh, final acceptance of a landscape plan uh, follows at a, at a subsequent meeting. 
And if we wanted to, we could say a subsequent meeting before the end of the calendar year or something like that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. All right, so uh, we have now the edits that Nate, I think, has uh, typed in. And unless anybody has any objections, I would uh, encourage us to move on from this, uh, unless anybody has any objections. Are there, do I see any hands? Bruce, your hand is still up, but I'll assume that's a legacy hand. Um, all right, so Chris, why don't, why don't we, uh, Chris and Nate, why don't we assume that what you've got here for number six is acceptable to the board and move on to number seven. Okay, number seven may be um, not necessary if number six is going to be worded as it is in red here. Um, number seven reads, there shall be screening along the southern property boundary to help shield views of the driveway and parking area. Screening can be in, in the form of a fence along the driveway. So perhaps you would want to delete number seven. Yes, that sounds like a good thing to do. Nate, if you could do that. Thank you. Okay, um, so now the next one is a parking management plan shall be provided to each rumor and tenant. And will it also be provided to the building commissioner? It should be provided to the building commissioner. It will be provided as um, part of the rental registration. Okay. That's a requirement. All right. So we don't need to say that here. No. Okay. Um, no, the next one, parking spaces shall be assigned to specific rumors and tenants. Now that may or may not be something that the applicants want to do. Um, applicants, do you have any objection to that? That sounds like a wise thing from my perspective. Yes. Oh, me? Yeah. Um, I guess the key thing is, is that, yeah, you know, we're gonna tell people where to park uh, and we'll just make sure they park in the same spot all the time. But right. I can't, I can't really tell you every year and to give you a you know where who's parking where like a map or anything like that no it, i think i think this is fine um so you will have a plan that you enforce with your rumors for yeah. each for each year's crop of people yeah. and and then uh you know i think you have to get a permit for rental every year and so whatever that year's plan is would be part of that applicant application for the rental permit Mm -hmm. All right, sounds good. Let's okay. go on to number eight. Um, so that number eight is um, has shifted. The numbering has shifted, yeah. but um, the next one is there shall be a total maximum of six cars allowed for all occupants. I think you've decided that that is a reasonable condition. Yes. Um, the next one, occupants of the efficiency unit shall be permitted to have only one car. This restriction shall be a condition of the lease. Uh, the next one is all parking shall occur on improved asphalt or gravel surfaces only. Uh, should we remove the or gravel? Mm -hmm. Okay. Parking for occupants tenants shall occur off street in defined spaces only and is prohibited along the apron of the driveway. Okay. Yep. Parking spaces shall be delineated with the installation of curb stops and or line painting. Um, that is another one to be discussed, I think. Do you want to have line painting? Curb stops kind of get knocked out of alignment by- Yeah, well, curb, curb stops seem a little bit excessive for this number of uh, cars and this kind of configuration. Um, you know, line, line, so painting line, also may. line painting, actually, I mean, we do don't want cars hanging out on the street and causing complaints again. Uh, Andrew, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I don't know necessarily about the line painting, because I think you might have some folks who have a big car, some folks who have a little car, and I imagine that they'll make it work out um, as long as the cars aren't hanging into the uh, into the street. Um, I actually have like a small question on 10 in terms of permitted uh occupants shall be permitted to have only one car might maybe should shall be permitted to have a maximum of one car because it's possible that they don't want any um in which case you know if they don't want any i would think that maybe that then becomes available for a for another tenant 
Um, I think the point is that they're they're the occupants are able to park their cars, and if someone doesn't want to use it, I think it should be available for somebody else. Sounds good, um, Andrew. And it but, sounds like you you kind of think we could get rid of number. It's not a commercial parking lot. Number yeah, I mean, 13, I think it's number thirteen could go away. Yeah, I, we've already got the time. parking required to be off street. So yes, okay. So Nate. Okay. Um, that's the next one is the new 13 snow removal shall occur with blowers unless snow plowing can be done to ensure snow storage does not encroach on the 25 foot wet wetland buffer areas. You want to leave that? Uh, Janet. Um, I'm fine with that. Actually, I, I let I, I had a um, change I wanted to make or an addition to condition three. So I just was sort of waiting for a natural pause, which I think might be this. Um, so I was hoping that on condition three, um, we basically put in the start with the sentence, there shall be no separate cooking facilities, period, and then talk about bedroom six. And that's just language out of the bylaw. And so it's not saying, so it's like our condition says you can't have a kitchen and the bylaw says that when you have like a boarding house, like with three people or less, that there shall be no separate cooking facilities. And so that's basically saying you shouldn't be cooking in the rooms. So I think we should just enforce the bylaw and reinforce the bylaw in the permit conditions. So that's, I'm a little out of sequence, but I was looking at section 5.0100. I think that would help make things more clear. Um, does anyone uh, want to comment on Janet's proposal? That was 5.0100 that you cited. 5.0101. Oh, it's, on, it's on page 61, but that may be just my version. So it's just a sentence out of the bylaw just saying you can't cook it. You, you know, you have a kitchen, but you can't have cooking, separate cooking facilities. And I think that might get rid of the gray area that, that I'm seeing as a, as a negative. All right. The condition does say um, a rooming unit under 5.0100. Yeah, so that section's already cited. Um, yeah, I just think it's gonna make it clear to everybody that so I don't see that it hurts. And I think it makes some clarity in terms of what people are worried about or what might be happening in room six or five or whatever. So. All right. Um, so I see four hands raised at the moment. Uh, I guess I, um, I'll start with the applicant. Uh, Mr. Allen, do you want to comment or Ms. Albano? Well, I think you should run that by Rob Morrow because he was very adamant about that wording. So I would think you need to talk to him about uh, if you want to change that because he does do everything per the applicable state law and he's well aware of section 5.0100. So I would think he would need to weigh in on that. All right, thank you. And it's in the minutes that he he felt that it was not a, uh, um, a dwelling unit. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Why would so we have your, to this, do that? Yeah, making that change is in direct contradiction to what he, he stated in the, uh, in the in the minutes of the last meeting. All right, thank you. Um, Andrew, I'm I know sorry. I think you had your hand up. You were you were down in thirteen or fourteen, wherever we. Yeah, were. yeah, and mine is actually the thirteen. And I'm just wondering. I, I think the point of thirteen. I would strike like the first half of it. The point is that the snow storage does not encroach above twenty five foot. Yeah. Does it matter if they plow it or blow it or shovel it? Right. It seems like too prescriptive. So I would I would recommend we simplify that. All right. Do you have a comment? Any thought about Janet's proposal? As long as we've got you on the line here. I I do not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So Nate, uh, how do you feel about? Uh, or it looks like you went ahead and edited number thirteen. Okay. Good. So um, quickly, number 13 was 
more applicable when the gravel driveway extended further into the yeah. property. And it was actually a condition of the order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. So it was just reiterating something that is part of a previous permit. So I think the change recommended by Andrew makes sense. Okay, thank you, Nate. Tom. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on um, Janet's proposal for number three. And I think, you know, while I, I see her concern as being related to bedroom six, I also think that it's a stipulation that like, are we not allowing other people in other rooms of other houses to put a microwave in a in a bedroom? And it just seems odd that we're gonna not allow someone to put a small refrigerator in a bedroom. Uh, so I feel like I'm, I'm concerned that it's setting up a precedent for telling people how they can use their rooms in their house without relying strictly on the law that's in front of us um, and is noted as um, specifically for bedroom six here. So I think, you know, it's I think I feel like it's fine as is in terms of setting limitations for bedroom six um, and it's standing as a um, <clears throat> as a room uh, rather than an apartment. Um, but I don't think we need to add any further stipulations for how people can utilize those spaces based on their understanding of the law. All right. Thank you, Tom. Janet. So I, th I think we're talking about two different things. And so Rob Mora was saying, you know, if you have a stove, that makes it a kitchen, right? And our bylaw is talking about lodgers, boardings, boarders, room, roomers, and bed and breakfast. And they're just, and literally the requirement isn't saying, you know, no extra stoves. It's saying there shall be no separate cooking facilities. So I think that's like an electric wok you know, all sorts of different things. And so I'm not adding this isn't adding an extra. It, this is what the bylaw says. This is the law in Amherst. And I'm just making it clear that there can't be separate co cooking facilities. Um, well, and I, I think the question is going to come down to what is a cooking facility as opposed to a cooking appliance. And, well, and, yeah. and I think you know, yeah, we don't want built-in stoves uh, and, and ranges, but the kind of portable appliances that people bring in and out of rooms, uh, that's a difficult thing to uh, police. And it's also, you know, not illegal. Well, so, it, so, I, so don't, I, I don't agree with you. <laughs> I, just, I just think that I'm basically saying, let's put this sentence in from the bylaw, which is our legal requirement. And I think that the reaction to it by the owners suggests to me that maybe people are cooking in that room. You know, they, they've gone from taking all the meals from one place. So this is a legal requirement of our town, separate from what is considered a separate dwelling unit under state law. And so I'm really, all I'm asking is, can we put in the sentence, it doesn't have to apply to bedroom six, but just to make it clear that when you're running a boarding house or a rooming house, people can't be cooking all their meals all over it. And, so and think, that's, that's the rule in oh, Amherst. Okay, okay. So, I, right, I, think, I think there's gonna be some nuance there where if you don't have a kitchen, you're not cooking, right? You're just heating something up. And so I think there's always gonna be some tension there um, about what's a cooking facility. So under building code, a microwave does not mean you're cooking, right? It's not considered a cooking facility. A microwave you know, doesn't, isn't a kitchen. It's not enabling you to cook. And so, um, I, I mean, I think to Janice's point, we could say something in that condition and reiterate what's what's actually written in 5.0100, but it doesn't, um, I mean, it's-, it's it, it won't preclude people from having a microwave right. or a refrigerator- Right. Um, in, in, the, in the room. <clears throat> well, um, I think we heard I think it was from Tom that uh, he was not in favor of changing the wording. Um, and uh, I can say I'm not in favor. Uh, if anybody else wants to express an opinion, uh, it, I, I think we, you know, I'd like to consider Janet's suggestion and make a decision and go on. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, if it, if, you know, we're thinking it doesn't have an impact anyway, I would. Um, I'd be inclined to to go with Jan and say let's use the language that's that's in place from the bylaw. It seems it seems like a reasonable thing to ask. Okay. 
Uh, Johanna. I'm inclined not to add it. Okay. All right. Well, it seems pretty even so far. Karen. Uh, I'm inclined not to add it. Uh, I actually think it's great that there is a room that uh, provides microwave and has a sink. I think it's they could maybe charge a little bit, but it's not a, a full cooking thing. And if the people that have that bring in lots of groceries to heat up in the microwave, I think that's a good thing. Okay. Um, let's see, who have we not heard from? Haven't heard from me. All right, Bruce. I, uh, I'm i marginally inclined to do as uh, Andrew and Janet suggest, but I think the, 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 the nuance is so slight that I really don't care that much. <laughs> so you're not going to break the tie. Huh? All right. All right. So, um, all right. So let's uh, just go through the roll call here. I want to find out where we stand. So uh, I'm going to call each person. Let me know if you're in favor of adding the language that that Janet is uh, proposing and Nate seems to be typing into the. Um... What? Well, I just did that just to show you. I just you did that just to show how it could work, right? So instead of saying yeah. a cooking appliance, it's a separate cooking facility. Um, All right. That's the language in the bylaw. Right. Um, and it looks like it is. It's applicable only to bedroom six. All right, Shannon, would this be acceptable to you? I'm having, actually, I can't see. I think I have my screen too big. Hang on a sec. Oops. <clears throat> sure, that's fine. I mean, I think I think it's strange to me that I'm just adding a sentence that reiterates the bylaw. I would do it as a standalone sentence, but I think um, I don't know. I just I I I, I don't know. That's okay. fine. All right. So, does anyone uh, strongly object to the edit that Nate just entered? Uh, I do not see any hands. I see one hand actually from Mr. Allen and Ms. Albano. Oh, I did some research on this and uh, I, I have it right here. The state sanitary code calls out a permanent, a permanent stove. And if you read about what they mean by a permanent stove, they mean that a person can move into that unit right now with enough groceries to cook a whole Thanksgiving day dinner, okay? And that's what they mean by a permanent stove. You can't do that with a microwave. You can't do it with a hot plate. You can't do that uh, with a, a little tiny oven. So if you really research what they mean by a permanent range or a permanent stove, that's what they mean. So you gotta do some research behind what the sanitary code really means. All right, and um, do you have any objection to the language we just uh, edited on condition number three? Yeah. Yes, because I agree with Rob Morrow. You need to uh, be as defined by applicable state law. Uh, but if you're going to go change it in the zoning, then you need to understand what the state law really says. Do you do you have objection to the language that's here, regardless of Rob Mora or anything else? Well, I just think it's so odd that it's got to be well, only. That's, well, I think that's that. fine. There, I guess. I guess it's right. not. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, As defined by. Okay, I'm, I, I actually right, write as fine. defined by applicable state right, law. Okay, fine. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm fine with that. Just... Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So, board members, uh, speak now. Let me know. Let us know if you have a strong objection to this. I don't think anybody had expressed it before when I asked. So uh, let's consider this. Uh, condition settled and moved back down farther to, I think we were on, we had gotten all the way up to number 14, I think. We had, I think, finished discussion of 13 and had edited that. So Chris, do you want to read number 14? 
Okay. Um, and as built drawing certified by a registered land surveyor shall be provided to the building commissioner upon installation of the parking areas and plantings to demonstrate compliance with the approved plans. All right, that seems pretty straightforward. Okay, any alterations to the approved site plans or building plans shall be submitted to the building commissioner who will determine if the changes are substantial enough to require submission to the planning board for review and approval. Sounds good. Next one, the approved management plans, parking plan and complaint response plan shall remain in effect at all times. All right. The owner shall maintain a log of complaints filed with the owner, manager, or town of Amherst and document actions taken by the owner in response to the complaint. This information shall be made available to the code enforcement office upon request. I assume this is a standard condition for rental properties. It is not, I don't mm. believe. All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Allen and Ms. Albano. Well, I'm confused by this statement because this already exists on the town website in the complaint log on the uh, Amherst GIS mapping. I can go in and see every every complaint that's lodged against anyone in this town that's lodged through the code enforcement officer. I think the, I the, 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 this also requires you to uh, keep a record of your responses and how you responded to the complaint. That's also recorded on the town website. I don't think that's available anymore. I'm sorry for butting in, but the uh, IT department has taken down a lot of the information that's been available on the town website. So I'm not sure that it's- I'm talking there. about the complaint on the GIS maps. There's a there's a section there on, on complaint history. Yep. That what the complaint is, what the complaint number was, the date, and then how it was resolved. All that's right. all on um, the GIS map. Nate, I uh, wondered if you could uh, give us some background on this on this requirement and why this uh, would come in. Yeah, sure. sure. So the, the GIS used to link to complaints and that stopped a few years ago. So what we're missing is the last two to three years of complaint history, and that will not be updated online. So you know, if you were to go look at any property, you might see complaints from the 2000s or 2000 teens, uh, but it stops around 2018, 19. Um, hmm. You know, there's been discussions with the um, you know, community resource committee, town council and others building inspections about um, changes to the rental registration. Not that this isn't necessarily one of those, but there has been discussions about having, um, you know, a better, you know, log of complaints and responses to it. And so, you know, uh, Rob Mora um, and inspection services requested this type of condition for this property, knowing the history. Yeah. Uh, there's some confusion about what, you know, what was done, when were the complaints filed? And so, um, you know, the inspection services is only one part of town government that receives complaints. It's also police, it could be Board of Health, it could be others. And so, you know, the log really is something that is, you know, on the owner, but, um, you know, we see it as a benefit to them that they could then respond to anything. So if there's a future complaint down the road, you could say, well, here's what, how, here's the actions that were taken, um, as opposed to the town, um, you know, going through different departments, the owner could have it just to also have a record. Right. And Nate, one one question. Uh, any entity in town that gets a complaint, would they notify the owner? So the owner will, in fact, hear about all the complaints? Yeah, I'm assuming that if, you know, there's a complaint filed with inspection services or the police, they they respond to the owner. Right. Because, you know, obviously the, the owner can't include a complaint on their log if they never hear about it from the town. Right. Right. All right, uh, Andrew. Yeah, that was one of my questions. Doug, this this one just seems confusing to me. Um, I don't know why. I, I guess whatever. It's not available anymore. Um, I would think that if it would it would sort of behoove the owners to go ahead and file that response. So rather than just have it available, why not just ask them to go ahead and record their response with the town. Um, I, I guess this, I'm just not really clear on, on yeah. why yeah. this is in here as written. So I mean, they the, might write it on a sheet of paper and then you know, whatever, like it, there's a, their basement's flooded and they lose it and we have no record of it. Like why not just ask them to reply 
so we have a record of what happened. It seems like it's that's in the interest of every, of all parties. Right. Well, it seems like this is a way, a stopgap at least, of filling the gap when the town decided they couldn't keep up with all these complaints and and keep their own log. I think it was yeah, it was more than just a you know a singular log. It was complaints for many, you know, for any purpose, whether it was fire, police, health board, you know, anything, um, inspection services, and so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this um, this condition could you know over time it could be that you know the owner keeps a record of the response. It doesn't mean that they keep it themselves. It could be that they then submit it through a town system. So, you know, we are working on getting new software. And so uh, it may be that they respond by, you know, logging into the town system and all this is filed with the town. It's not, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a paper copy, uh, you know, kept in their basement. It could be, um, you know, through some other, other resource that we, you know, it's not defined really um, so, how that log is maintained. Well, but it, but it's it should be it's pretty clear the owner has to maintain it. And so right. if, if the town is going to take that responsibility back, do we have to go back and change all these permits? No, no, it's not. No, the owner would still do it. They would, they would input it into the town system. So we'd, you know, we have a, we'd have a database that the owner could access. Uh -huh. This doesn't seem quite future proofed like that. And yeah, I think that you'd want something that would say that, you know, they must maintain documentation in compliance with current Mm -hmm. uh, current law, but the town, the town current system for right, yeah. Nate, Nothing do you that. feel like this could be edited at all, or do we need to just accept it and move on? Uh, Nate, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Yeah, no, I'm thinking. I think. Okay. I think the condition is generic enough that if if we have a a system that the town can use that then this can apply to it. You know, if we were to specify something really, you know, some type of log and it that didn't work. But I think, you know, the maintain a log of complaints and actions taken in response. It could be that you know we set up a, the town sets up a system for all rental registration properties, and you know, in this in this you know. It would still satisfy this condition that they enter into that type of reporting system. Um, so, well, I mean, if I if I were if I were writing a condition based on what you just said, I think it would be written a little differently. It would be something like the owner shall participate in the town's complaint uh, and complaint response log system as currently in effect. Or if none is available from the town, it shall maintain its an independent log of complaints and responses in response, you know, made. Uh, so, you know, this this is not this right. has the owner maintaining their log regardless of what the town does. Yeah. Yeah, I like what you you said, Doug. I don't think there's a there may not be a system in place now, and so through. Um, the technology of Zoom will take your transcript and make that a condition. Okay, so you're, <laughs> so you're just going to make a note now that we're going to edit that for Doug's comments. Huh? If 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 the board thinks that's that's a you know probably a more reasonable. All right. Well, let's see. Let's see what the the. Okay, I see two hands from board members and Chris Chamberlain. What would you like to say? Yeah, I guess I'm. I'm just. I think I'm not clear on what the purpose of uh, requiring the owner to keep this log so that the code enforcement office can receive it. You know, if it's a question of enforcement and making sure that these complaints get followed up on, if the code enforcement office isn't doing that, then I don't think they're going to be enforcing this condition that the log of the things that they haven't followed up on is being kept. Um, well, I think, for instance, there's a lot of police complaints about parking on this property. We're not going to inspection services doesn't, um, you know, reach out to police on a weekly basis to ask what kind of parking complaints have there been on properties in town. Right. But for instance, if a neighbor complains a year from now that cars are parking all over the street and they said they complained, you know, 15 times, then we can go to the owner and to the police and we can corroborate whether those complaints were actually filed. And so we have an owner log and a police log 
but we're not inspection services doesn't you know scan all the police logs you know because that's just a lot more work so that that's what this um condition is trying to get at so that there is a you know a two-part piece to a complaint history there's an owner log and then there's whatever logs are kept by the town and we can use those to try to rectify the situation all right and, and um, i guess i would just point out that that still requires you to go and pull it from the police if there's going to be a verification stage but um right well, I do think if I'm an owner of a property and I'm getting complaints, I want to keep track of how I responded so that I can defend myself if someone is alleging that I'm not being responsive. So, you know, I think it's good practice just to keep your own records. Janet? So I, I sort of read this differently from um, Nate's explanation. I thought that the idea behind it was, you know, that the owner is maintaining a log of complaints because there's been a history of complaints. And then we're getting into the he said, he said, she said kind of situation. And then also, you know, maybe a little self-reflection if you have a log and you notice there's constant complaints about this or, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm a landlord and I get a lot of complaints too, but, you know, it's, it's like a faucet here and something there. And I, I just kind of, I'm one, you know, I, I, is the intent just to have the owner make sure they're documenting what's been complained about and what actions they take because later on the town would want to look at that or is it a self reflection tool or is it the corroboration I don't know I just kind of it's, it's, I'm not sure I understand, you know, what it is meant to do but the language seems to indicate that the loaner, owner has to just log every complaint and said yeah I fixed the faucet or I asked the tenant to move the car. So it's very broad. Yep. Uh, I'm seeing Nate just shake his, nod his head. So uh, I guess that what you said, Janet, is generally what the point was. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little both. I mean, the self-reflection is a, it could be a great tool. I don't know if that was necessarily part of it, but it was more about ha having a consolidated record that, you know, code enforcement could, could use, you know, so whether right. that's, so know, is someone... one of the burdens of being a, a landlord in this town is consolidating the complaints that go into various town departments. Mm -hmm. All right, Andrew. Yeah, uh, I, I, I personally don't think that's a reasonable burden for the land, the, the owner, I think like, it should be it should be made available, you know, through through the town, right? I mean, we talked about this being an, an opportunity to to dwell upon what went right or what went wrong. Like, why not let the whole community benefit from that? Um, my two cents. Uh, it, it it seems like asking the landlord to maintain these records um, is unreasonable in my mind. I mean, I would do it, and I'm sure that that the, these owners would, but still. Um, the town should know. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, no more hands. I know I've heard we've we've had some skepticism about this, but I'm not hearing great objection to it. And it does seem like Rob Mora was interested in something like this. Uh, Mr. Allen. I'm just going to interject here. Is this a requirement that you've given to all of the high rise student dormitories that are being built in the center of this town? We've had tenants who have moved out of some of those. They've had plenty of complaints that have never gotten resolved. And I can't imagine any of those owners of any of those high rise dormitories have even written them down. <laughs> we had a tenant that moved in here, didn't have Wi Fi for most of the school year. And she had to use her own data plan all the time so she could do work during the pandemic. And this is in one of the new high rises. Not an old one, one that was only about four years old. So my question is, this is fine, I think, as long as it's being applied uniformly to all landlords and all owners of apartments, that's fine. Well, Mr. Allen, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question. I think it's come up on your application. And uh, Nate, do you want to comment or should we just move on? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is also the history that there has been some complaints about parking and other things. So, you know, if, if a pro if a property uh, has consistent complaint history and it's time for permitting, then this type of condition would be applied to it. Okay, thank you. Well, 
I'm going to interject. My concern was this poor woman who couldn't have, didn't have internet in her high rise dormitory apartment in the center of town. There was no one she could complain to except for the landlord and the landlord didn't do anything. And now by you saying the town is not going to take complaints anymore. What, what is it? What is a kid supposed to do? Uh, I think you're misunderstanding Mr. Allen. The town accepts complaints and they do get acted on by whatever department receives them. The town does not consolidate the list of complaints between different departments. And I think uh, Nate was clear that uh, because your property has a history of complaints, this uh, condition was suggested by the building commissioner. All right, so let's move on to number 18, Chris. This special permit shall be filed with the Registry of Deeds prior to any work proceeding. That's a standard condition. I mean, right. it's a standard practice, not right. often a condition. Um, 19, all work associated with the approved plans and conditions of this permit shall be completed within 90 days of the issuance of this permit unless extended by the building commissioner for good cause. I think at this point, that's going to be a tough one to meet because of the, we're moving into winter and as of um, Thanksgiving, the asphalt plants are closing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I think if you wanted to put a date on it, you're probably looking at, and people are having a hard time getting contractors to work for them. So I don't know if this type of uh, date is reasonable. I would say maybe something like next August or something like yeah. that, if you yeah. really wanted to put a date on it. Right. Um, I think we do need to put a date on it. We, we want to resolve these this this these conditions that uh, have prompted all these complaints. So why don't we put uh, say August thirtieth of twenty twenty three? Anybody object to that? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Hold on. Uh, hold on. I do have one thing to say. All right. Uh, we have we are we are, have to go back before the wetlands commission because we have to get our wetlands permit modified. That could be anywhere from a thirty day to maybe a two or three month process. Um, so that may affect this. However, it also says unless extended by the building commissioner for good cause. So I assume that if for some reason we can't make that date because we got stuck getting our wetlands permit over four months, we're fine, correct? Yeah, I think that I, I believe that would be uh, considered good cause. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I've spoken with the wetlands administrator, Aaron, and she said that, you know, if this plan were approved and it's reducing the impact to the buffer, then it may be able to be done um, without a, a new hearing, a revised wetland permit. So it would be something that could happen a little more um, seamlessly than you know a new application. So. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, Number upon, upon change of ownership, the new owner shall appear at a public meeting of the planning board to review an updated management plan, parking plans, and complaint response plan. Yep. Um, okay, and then there shall be an arborist on site to monitor construction for safety, protection, and health of existing trees. Um, what do we mean by on site? Uh, we don't want that person to move in and become a fourth border. Um, the arborist, arborist should be consulted during construction, so. Right, shall, shall be uh, present during construction or, uh, you know, visit Period. during Periodic construction. Monitoring. Shall monitor the construction or. Or how about a certified arborist shall monitor construction? Yes. For the safety, protection, and health of existing trees. Yeah, that makes sense. OK. Um, now that you're at the end, I want to uh, actually go ahead, Mr. Allen. Well, again, I ask, is this a standard uh, language that you have on all special permits in this town? 
this kind of uh, extensive conditioning the is certified uh, arborist. Is that required on all all building in this town? Uh, no, but this is a special knowledge. permit, and a special permit can have special conditions. All right, and it's being applied here for what reason? There's one tree. Make sure that the existing trees survive. There's ex existing trees on the southern property line, and there's also an existing tree that you're moving. So those trees need to be maintained. So that doesn't happen on all projects? We, we don't have necessary. construction. We don't have construction so close to existing trees, and we don't move existing trees typically. <clears throat> but if there was a project that you know was within the drip line of a mature tree, and the applicant says that they're going to you know save the tree, a condition will say that that mature tree is going to be preserved, and possibly you know the use of an arborist to ensure that. So it really is dependent on the application what you know what's being proposed. So. In this instance, you're so close to, you know, existing trees that are providing screening. So if, if for instance, you know, you put the driveway and you're like, you know what, those trees need to be cut down and you just cut them down. Well, you know, the plan is being approved with the assumption that those trees are gonna remain. And so this condition helps ensure that. So Chris, I'd like to ask one question about something I don't see in the conditions, and that is the owner occupancy. Uh, why do we not need to say that the this property shall be owner occupied in these conditions? This is a um, two family house in a, what is this, RN district? What district is this name? Is this required to be owner occupied? It's RG, and I think our application does say that it's owner occupied duplex. You can put a condition in that says it needs to be owner occupied. Yeah, to, to have rumors, it has to be owner occupied. So right. um, it's, I mean, we could have it uh, as maybe like a second or third condition. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, it says uh, 5.01000 says there shall be an owner who resides on the premises responsible for the operation of a you know, rumor lodging or boarding house. Um, so that's, that's part of the zoning bylaw. All right, that, well, having it in there, that's fine. I guess I, I, I just wanna make sure that this will always be owner occupied when it's having all these rumors. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think it hurts, you know, similar to what Jana had been saying, do we make it, um, you know, we could just have a new condition number two saying that the property shall be Owner no, I, mean, I don't I don't care if they're in the efficiency apartment or if they're in the main house, but I think it's a good idea to put that in. Yep. Okay. I mean, should we say um, while it is being used for rumors? Um, you know, is that if 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 rumors are present or if if rumors are leasing rooms within the property, they, I, you know, I, think, I think the rule is is that if they're having borders, they have to be in that unit. It can't okay. be they can't move to the extra unit, and at that point it just becomes a rental. Yeah. So. I would just leave it. The property shall be owner occupied. Period. And if someone wants to change that in the future, they'll come back and change it. All right. I think that'll be better for all concerned. Uh, Andrew. Uh, I was thinking maybe the opposite. That would be good to say it should be owner occupied if rumors are present. Because if they don't have rumors, do they need to occupy it? Nate, you all right with that? You know, I was just just cutting it out. We just let the bylaw be the bylaw. Okay, Janet, I'm, I'm yeah, surprised to hear that from you. <laughs> I'm try, I, I tried to insert that sentence before because I think nobody realized it, and especially the owners. Uh -huh. So we can have the bylaw can be more strict than the state law, but you if you have a dwelling unit, you can have borders in it. But if you you can't. You know, if they move into the excess, the other unit, it's not, you know, it's not a boarding house anymore. So 
if they're in their main house and they have borders, they're fine. They have to stay there. If they move right. out or leave, you know. <laughs> So. All right. Well, with Janet's endorsement, why don't we take it out, Nate, and we'll just shorten this up by, you know, 25 characters and save a little bit of ink. Right. All so right. the reason why, yeah, just quickly, the reason why this can be allowed is that the rumors are accessory to the single family use, you know, an owner occupied use. And so I mean, that's, you know, if that ceases to exist then this permit, you know, then they're, they're in violation of that permit. Okay. All right, so uh, it's now quarter and nine. We've gotten through the conditions. We still have the findings, and I believe there were some waivers to go through. Uh, we are normal, we're over time for our, for our break, so why don't we take a five-minute break? It's now 8.42. Would you all come back at 8.47? And you can mute your microphone and turn off your camera while you're away.
All right, Pam, why don't you uh, end our break on the screen? <clears throat> What time do you have, Mr. Marshall? Well, my my, my computer's showing eight forty-seven. Mine's eight forty-six. Yeah, you and I okay. are one minute off. I don't we know. are. Must be the vast geographic distance between us. You're in a different time zone. <laughs> That's right. I'm up here on the mountain. Right. <laughs> Takes longer to get here. Catching up at the speed of light. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a short meeting. Yeah, I was. Uh, it's still going to be a short. Don't give up. During the break, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, you jinxed mm -hmm. us. <clears throat> we just have to move along. Well, I think we're not too far from the end of this one. All right. Uh, let's see. We have all of the board members except for Janet, who is who are uh, back with us, and then sounds like. Nate is not back with us. He's probably getting some aspirin or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, he sounds worse than I am, although I may sound bad to you all. <clears throat> See if the two of them can come back soon. There's Janet, all right. All right, so uh, Chris, we had gone through the conditions. Do you, th you think we should now go through the findings? I, if you responded, Chris, I, you were muted. Did Mr. Colden um, volunteer to read the findings or shall I read them? I think he volunteered to help out. So I don't know if he was specific, but maybe we can ask Bruce. Can you, I, would you like I, to? I volunteered to take over when Chris was done. Yeah, it sounds like she's ready to pass the baton, so. And we wonder, we typically read the findings or do we reckon that we've read them before? Uh, I believe we usually read them. I can read them. I'm not. Oh, no. No, no, I'm no, not no. Uh, tired yet. So, do you want well, me to? Why, read why don't we them? let Chris? Why don't we let Bruce read a few, and uh, we'll save you for expert testimony later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see if that works for everybody. Um, oh, I don't have them up, of course. Uh, do you want? No, no. Uh, Nate's bringing them up because if they have to be edited in anything, he does that. Yeah. So that. Oh, there's Nate. He is back. Okay. Right. Okay. Board found under section eleven twenty four of the zoning bylaw as follows: eleven twenty four oh oh. The project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the bylaw, the zoning bylaw. The applicant has applied for a special permit review to comply with conditions from a 2007 special permit. Finding two, uh, I'm just gonna say 2401. Town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions as the current and proposed use of the property is unlikely to create such conditions. Uh, finding uh, 24, Oh, two. Uh, Bruce, hold on. Uh, Andrew right. has his, his hand oh, up. Sorry. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, I hate to belabor this. So I'm, and maybe Janet can answer, but does it, um, is that kind of standard language um, legally? Just uh, minimizing detrimental or offensive action sounds kind of arbitrary. Um, that isn't that from the bylaw? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the that's the language that's in the bylaw. Arbitrary. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's great. It still sounds kind of arbitrary to me, but if it's in the bylaw, I'm not. Well, that's that's what we're supposed to decide what's detrimental and and offensive and things. So yeah. we have found that this is uh, uh, we, we have found this what what I just read. Uh, I, we believe we have found it. Um, can, moving on, uh, twenty four oh two, abutting properties will be protected. Oh, I. I read that one, didn't I? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, no, I didn't. Uh, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Go ahead. Abutting properties will be protected from detrimental uh, site characteristics resulting from the proposed use as parking uh, from the proposed use 
as parking will be provided on the site for owners and tenants. Exterior lighting will be downcast and or shielded and will not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. And there will be screening, landscaping or fencing to buffer adjacent properties. So this finding the last clause, I don't know that we're clear about the extent of screening that will will end up in the final plan. Chris, do we need to include this? You don't need to include that last phrase. Yeah, Nate, do you have any objection to removing it? Everybody all right with that? Okay, I don't see any hands. Moving on. Uh, 20, uh, finding 2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities has been addressed. The existing back deck will remain and the driveway layout has been designed to reduce impacts to the backyard. Okay. That's pretty clear. 24, uh, 2410, unique or important natural, historic or scenic features will be protected since the owner has received approval from the Conservation Commission for work near a wetland resource area. And perhaps if you could roll it up a bit, yes, because my laptop is screening my monitor here. Thank you. Uh, 2411, the project <clears throat> provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. Uh have we received a management plan yet, or will that come with the rest, the rental permit? You have received a management plan because it's required as part of the application. All right. And it's really a two-page thing unless they've added something to it. I'm Nate would know more about that. You know, the applicant completed it. It was pretty thorough. You know, they have under store storage under the deck. They have um, you know, a contractor who takes care of the the, you know, waste and recycling. Um, okay, thanks. I just didn't remember seeing it, but it, I don't dispute that it, it was there. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. Finding 11-24-12, the property is connected to town, sewer, and water. I think that's clear. Finding 11-24-13, the proposed drainage system within, the adjacent, within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle stormwater, the increased size of the driveways will have minimal impacts to stormwater. 11-24-14, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project protects existing trees and will transplant a tree uh, and much of the existing back lawn area will remain intact. So I, I guess we could leave that uh, if if the board at the moment is fine with the extent of landscaping that we've been promised, and we've uh, we've we've got the promise of a of a plan of, to of our a plan to come, but we yeah. don't know what, really what it'll even show and whether it shows anything at all new. Uh, but if Mr. it doesn't, it won't be adequate. Right, Mr. Allen. Yes, I had. Uh, like I had mentioned, and I had sent an email to, to Nathaniel and Christine, uh, I did have the tree warden out here. And uh, since when we first started this process, we have a tree which we thought was a public shade tree in the front yard, but then we didn't know where the property line was. And then once we got the front property line staked out, he came out here to look at it. And he said, it's not a public uh, shade tree because it's on our property. It's about a foot in from the uh, town uh, comment. So I'm not sure if that affects the wording here. Um, and it's not really clear whether it needs to be called a street tree or, yeah, yeah. And, and I would suggest to you say, and, and may transplant a, street, a tree. So are you not expecting to move that tree, even though now that you know it's not a street tree? We're not really sure because it's not clear where he planted it. Uh, I have to call, was it 811, the dig safe? Because my fear is he planted it right over our water line. And if we try to move it, the root ball could be down around where the water line is. So I, I'm not really sure what's going to happen if we try to move it. So I have to call dig safe to figure out what out is out there underneath this tree. 
Well, I guess I'm I'm a little bit dismayed to hear that that something you have that consistently said you were going to do in this during this process, uh, you're now saying you're not sure you're going to do. Well, the problem was is that until we got the the front boundary lined up, um, we didn't know if it was a street tree or not. We just made an assumption that it was a public shade tree. So, are the plans that Mr. Chamberlain has provided, which say you will move that tree and replant it, uh, are they inaccurate? I'm not sure yet because I have to call Dig Safe to figure out what's in the root ball at this point. Uh, the water line will be five foot down. I don't think your root ball is going to go anywhere near that. All right. Well, that's a, I, I have to, before we do the transplant, we have to look and see what's under there. That's all. Because we have well, a gas line out there too. All right. So, um, Chris, I don't like having findings that are inconsistent with the drawings that were provided. So, I think you should keep this requirement. Um, yeah. But the project protects existing trees and will either transplant a tree or plant a new tree in the front yard. They've promised to have to keep that tree, and I think that they need to keep that tree. So if you want to say transplant or plant a new tree in the front yard, you could say that. Uh, Andrew. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of planting a new tree, would it, would it be, uh, uh, would it match the caliper? I guess, like, do we need some parameters around that? You could say plant a new tree to match the caliper of the existing tree. And species, you know, I would just say to match. To match yeah. the existing tree. Uh, plant a matching new tree. Well, it's at the circumference, it's about two inch diameter. So I don't so think that's you could buy a tree. That's, that's the tree you could buy. Yeah. All right. So anybody? And everybody all right with that? Uh, Mr. Allen, your hand is up. I'll assume that's a legacy hand. Sorry. All right. Moving on. Yes. 112415, uh, the soil erosion control methods included in the approval from the Conservation Commission are considered adequate to control soil erosion, both during and after construction, as there is limited erosion from this project. Yeah, um, Bruce, I'm going to since we've mentioned the Conservation Commission again, I, I want to ask about 2413. Chris or Nate, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd almost rather say the proposed drainage system will be adequate uh, since the owner has received approval from the Conservation Commission, because uh, I think that's more definitive and puts the responsibility in the right place. But the Conservation Commission hasn't seen the current driveway. It's, uh, less, it's less of an impact than the uh, pr all right. proposed. All right, then I'll, then I'll withdraw my, in, I'll, I'll withdraw the comment. Let's, let's just back it up and leave it alone. All right, Bruce. Uh, where are we? Thank you. 112416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances as the proposed uses do not generate nuisances. 112417, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because the condition of the permit requires that exterior lighting be downcast and or shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. 112418, not uh, applicable. Hold on, hold on Bruce. Okay, uh, Andrew. Sorry. I, I, I was tempted to let this go, but uh, what is the nuisance in 2416? It's it things was... like uh, noises, smells, smoke, um, things like that. They list out a bunch of different nuisances, 2416. Okay. If it's, if it's, if it's uh, clear and uh, somewhere else. That's fine. Yeah, it's it's listed in the bylaw: air pollution, water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, and vibration. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Not barking dogs, huh? 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. It doesn't make much sense standing alone. Yeah. Um, uh, 1124.18, not applicable. The property is not located in the Prod Clone Conservancy District. 1124.19, the project has been approved by the Amherst Conservation Commission, including conditions that will protect wetlands in according with the Wetlands Protection Act, Chapter 131, Section 40, and the Amherst Wetlands Bylaw. Is that the case, Chris, or it really it hasn't yet finished? I don't they did, know. They did, they did receive an order of conditions for the original plan. And so what they're proposing now is, um, you know, reduced impervious area. You know, they shrunk the driveway. They're actually, you know, staying further away from the well and resource area. So uh, it would, you know. So it's, so it's accurate since they got the order of conditions. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. 112420, the planning board did not choose to refer to the design principles and standards set forth in sections 3.3040 and in 3.2041 of the zoning bylaw because the project does not involve changes to the building structure. 112421, the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking landscape and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and neighborhood, including parking driveways along Spalding Street. 1124.22, not applicable. Building sites shall avoid to the extent feasible the impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, wetlands. There are minimal changes to the site. 112423, not applicable. There is not more than one building on the site. 112424, not applicable. There is no HVAC equipment, storage areas, loading docks, rooftop equipment, or dumpsters that require screening or vegetation. 112430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement, both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. There are a sufficient number of designated parking spaces on the property for the occupants. I think we've beaten that one out. 112431, the proposed curb cut for two parking spaces does not create hazardous exits, exits or turning movements. 112432, the location and design of parking, bicycle storage, Drive aisles provide safe and convenient use of the site. 112433, not applicable as there is no access to adjoining properties. 112434, not applicable. The property is not a business or commercial district. 112435, not applicable. There is not joint access driveways between adjoining properties. 112436, not applicable as there is no change in use to impact the traffic generated at the site. 112437, not applicable, no traffic impact report will be required. Thank you, Bruce. Nate, could you scroll up a bit? Great. Will I do the draft waivers? Uh, sure. Um, the draft waivers, nine point, sorry, 7.90. To waive section 7.0002 to allow up to three designated parking spaces within the front setback. Shall I read them all or do we want to? Uh, why don't you read them all? Okay. Um, the second one, 6.29, if applicable, to waive section 6.24 to allow a six foot tall fence along the side property line between the front lot line and the minimum front setback line provided that all other standards in section 6.2 of the zoning bylaw are met. Okay. So those are the two waivers. The last one may not be applicable. It doesn't sound like we were, you know, had a right. condition to have a fence. So I think we can remove that. Yeah. 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 It, it comes back if the uh, submitted plan has a fence, right? That's, that's, that's six foot tall. <laughs> All right, so uh, 
Chris, help me out here. We're going to need a motion. Motion to, to approve the plan to, to close the public hearing and to approve the plan, um, the site plan, to approve the uh, interior plan and to approve the use of the property um, and to uh, with the findings and conditions as enumerated and the waivers as enumerated. All right. All right. And I say so moved. Since sure, I'm still, Bruce. <laughs> then I'll mute. All right. I'll second. I'll second. All right. Thank you, Janet. Uh, does anybody want to have further discussion about this? I know you're all excited to keep talking about it. Uh, I would like to give the public uh, an additional chance for comment. Uh, I see we have a few more people that showed up in the public comment in the public. Does anybody from the public want to make a final comment before we have a vote about this? Uh, I see Rebecca Cornell's comment, or <laughs> excuse me, I see Rebecca Cornell's hand, if you would bring her over uh, and give her a chance to speak. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to thank you all for your attention and to the detail on this problem um, and on this project. Um, as you know, it's been a, a long time coming and it's not easy work to get through these challenges. And I just wanted to say thank you to the board members and the staff. Thank you very much. I do not see any other hands with public comment. Um, Chris, since you gave us the text for our motion, uh, do you have that sufficiently recorded so that uh, we can go ahead and simply uh, vote to adopt or not the motion that you uh, articulated? I think so. It's essentially close the public hearing, approve the site plan, approve the building plan, and um, with the conditions and findings and waivers as enumerated. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so why don't we go through that? Uh, we'll start from the beginning of the alphabet. Uh, Bruce. Aye. And Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you, board members. Thank you, uh, Mr. Allen and um, Ms. Albano. Uh, thank you, Chris Chamberlain. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you at a, at a later meeting with your landscape plan. Great, thank you. All right. All right, so the time now is 9.10, and we can move on to item four on our agenda, which was a continued public hearing for uh, Archipelago Investments at 47 Olympia Drive. I'm sorry. Um, uh, that's SPR 2023-01 and SPP 2023-01. Uh, Chris, uh, am I correct that the applicant has requested to continue the hearing? That's correct, yes. They've requested to continue it to November 2nd. All right, so I assume you need a board vote to uh, allow that continuation? Yes, and it should be November 2nd at 7.30 because we have a public hearing for flood mapping at 635. We have a public hearing for um, food and drink establishments at seven o'clock. And so this one can be at 730. All right. Um, I assume I don't have to read the paragraph of introduction uh, that it was is that true or do I? I don't think you need to. No, it's just a request to continue the public hearing. So yeah. you're not taking any testimony. You're not going to discuss it. You're just going to continue it to a date certain in the future. All right. All right. So uh, would any board members like to make a motion that we continue this hearing to November 2nd at 7.30 p.m.? Tom? So moved. Thank you. Uh, I'll, Andrew? I'll second. Okay, thank you both. 
Uh, board members, is there any discussion about this continuation? Um, anybody, Andrew, you, you would like to speak? Yeah, no apologies, just a refresher, if, if uh, you don't mind, Chris. And, um, yeah, Chris. They don't need to provide, provide any grounds for the request and what is the, uh, how, how far can they push this request? I'm sorry, I didn't explain that. Um, they um, they have gone before the Conservation Commission because they have impacts on the wetlands. They weren't aware that they had as much impact on the wetland as they do. So they've met with the Conservation Commission on the 28th of September. Um, I think they met with them last week, or maybe they didn't because I think the Conservation Commission didn't meet because of a quorum problem. But in any event, they're in a process with the Conservation Commission, um, and they're hoping to wrap it up, I believe, this coming week, which will be the 26th. I'm not sure that that will happen. Um, but it may, and if it does, then they would like to come back and present plans to you um, that that are being considered by the Conservation Commission. So, okay. Um, I guess just to be tidy, then um, thanks for that extra guidance because I, I don't think they share that in their request. Would it make sense for the uh, for the motion to actually reflect that that this is not their attempt to like stall this? They're just they are waiting to hear back from the town before they can move forward. And maybe it doesn't matter and I'm fine with that, but um, that that was actually interesting. Um, that was useful to hear that because I, I wasn't sure if this was a, a well, Andrew, Andrew, we can certainly include that in the minutes. Of if, folks, if folks are comfortable with that, I think it might make sense just to have a cleaner record that that they're they're waiting for the town. They're not trying to yeah. uh, game the process. The Stretch it out. But there, it's just the opposite. They're really eager to get going with this thing. So um then perhaps perhaps we yeah. would modify that i mean I, i'd be comfortable doing that if, if other folks are all right it's good chris are you okay modifying the text of the motion yep to continue mm -hmm. all right janet um i i'm not sure if i we talked about this or i mentioned this last time um on the last continuance but we haven't gotten a traffic impact report and so that might be a reminder for them. Thank you, Janet. Okay. All right, so we'll go through and vote to continue. Uh, Bruce, you're right with continuing to November 2nd? Yes. And uh, Tom? Hi. Andrew? I, Janet. I. Johanna. I. And Karen. I. And I'm an I as well. All right. So the this hearing is continued to November second. All right. So on to number five on the agenda. The time is nine sixteen. And we are up to uh, needing to talk about a recommendation to town council uh, regarding the Meadows subdivision. Uh, um, and there, this has been referred to us by uh, town council for a report on roadway acceptance. Chris, do you want to introduce this or are, is Jason Skeels finally have his moment? Jason Skeels has been waiting patiently. Um, why don't I say a few words and then maybe he can say something. So All this right. is a project that's been around since the early 2000s. The roadway was substantially completed around 2004 and the developer Tofino Associates made um, attempts to complete a punch list around that same time between 2004 and 2007. Um, the punch list items were not completely finished. And then um, the roadway has been used by the residents and people who live in town. Um, but Tofino never made the request to have the roadway accepted by the town. Um, so fast forward a number of years and um, there was a meeting 
Well, I should say first that D Jason Skeels has prepared a punch list of items that's dated January 21st. Um, and it's fairly lengthy and you've received copies of it. We now have numbers that are associated with that um, punch list given to us by Doug Donnell, who's one of the residents of, um, of the Meadows subdivision. The uh, estimate that he gave us amounts to roughly $200,000 for the work on both roads, but it doesn't include um, any of the crack ceiling. It also is in 2021 numbers and not in 2022 numbers. And I'm not sure if it reflects um, the wage rates that the town would need to pay if it were to accomplish uh, the work, um, but that's perhaps something that Jason can answer. Um, but in any event, there was a, a meeting of the DPW um, and uh, of some members of the staff of the DPW. I'm not, I'm, I'm unclear about exactly who was there and a representative of Tofino Associates and residents of the Homeowners Association. And they talked about a shorter punch list, um, which includes three items, which is on a memo that I sent you. Um, and so now we're talking about, um, can the planning board recommend to town meeting that the roadway be accepted? And um, as I said, the, the members, the residents of the subdivision have made this request. Um, and I've outlined in a memo that I sent to you, I think I sent it last night, um, four potential um, recommendations that you can make. And I, why don't I read them? And then Jason can give a presentation about his point of view. And then you probably will want to hear from uh, Connie Kruger, who's a resident of the um, subdivision. So my suggested recommendations were four, four of them, um, and they were all different. So the first one is um, to re that the planning board recommend. Uh, Chris. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Andrew seems can to be interested. Uh, in yeah. Could we just pull up the email? I, 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 I think it came in this morning. I looked through it quickly. I think I got it. But. It would be useful for me just to be able to see this. That. Yes. See, this was the report or the memo that Chris sent us. Yeah, it was comprehensive. I just, it would, yeah. it would help me to okay. have it. So that's the punch list. Thank you. Um, I, oh, I don't know. Is if Nate I have still that. here? The, the, body, um, the body email had your four recommendations. Oh, I, could, I could share it. I have it. Yeah, I'm yeah, hopeless. It wasn't the attachments. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so it wasn't the attachments. Sorry. It was the email itself. So. How's there that? was an attachment October 19th. It was sent out. There it is. Yeah. How's that? Okay. So among the recommendations um, that I'm making to the planning board of steps that you could take to make a recommendation to town council. The first one is to recommend the town council accept the roadways in their current condition after Tofino completes the short list of tasks, which was referred to um, in another memo that I sent you, and also in this memo, I think. Um, and that amounts to about $20,000 worth of work. And I'm saying that the town holds $23,000 in escrow to complete the roadways. Uh, this recommendation would result in the town becoming responsible for the repairs needed to bring the roadway up to town standards. But if the recommendation is followed by town council, this recommendation is the most likely to resolve the issues in the shortest amount of time. And we'll provide the homeowners with reassurance that the town would be responsible for maintaining and plowing of the roadways in the future. So that's one possible recommendation you could make. The second recommendation would be um, recommend that the town council not accept the roadways until the work on the longer punch list has been completed. Uh, Tofino has not agreed to complete the tasks on the longer punch list. And this recommendation, in my opinion, is likely to prolong the discussion and possibly result in no work being done to complete or repair the road in a timely manner. And I'm, I'm, uh, what should I say? Guessing, guessing that there could be legal action on the part of one or more of the parties if this recommendation were um, taken. The third possible recommendation is that the, uh, to recommend to the town council that um, there be a negotiation between Tofino and the town to share the costs of completing the punch list items prior to the acceptance of the roadway. The town has also um, offered to include Tofino in its uh, bid for roadway work um, for the upcoming season. 
Um, but Tofino has not shown an interest in negotiating this type of agreement with the town. And the fourth possibility is that the planning board offer no recommendation to town council on the acceptance of roadways, either because you don't feel like you have enough information or you are confused or whatever. There's no requirement that the planning board offer a recommendation to town council and um, and the and the recommendation itself is non binding so you need to choose as to whether you want to make a recommendation or not. So now I think that you might want to hear from um, Jason Skeels and uh, Connie Kruger, who represents the um, Homeowners Association. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Jason, why don't you go next? Yeah. Hi. Can everybody hear me OK? Yep. All good. OK. My last meeting, my microphone for some reason got turned down to almost nothing. So I spent about a half an hour trying to find it and getting it all right. Um, I honestly don't have a whole lot to say about this subdivision. Um, you know, I, I, I'll talk about my own paving budget, which is, you know, in a 17 to $20 million deficit to keep up with the roads the town already does own. Um, and I would hate to see something else get, you know, put in front of any of those needs um, as, a, as a road that just got accepted. Um, so I, I would prefer to see the road brought up to speed, honestly, uh, before. I'm sorry, say, say that Say that sentence again. I, I've, I said I would prefer that the road be brought up to speed, you know, be brought up to, a, I would rather accept a new road than a 20 year old road um, because it, you know, it just takes a drain on my budget and the town wide paving budget. And, and honestly, it might set a not so good precedent of, well, we could be accepting a dirt road next where the resident has complained about it long enough and doesn't want to deal with it and they pay taxes too but it's a private road it's not paved um so i just see that it sort of you know it could set a nasty precedent for accepting roads that haven't been well maintained all right thank you all right uh pam why don't we bring connie kruger over and give her the floor <clears throat> Hello, Hi, Connie. I uh, wondered if you could give us your name and your address and then yes. make your remarks. Um, okay. Connie Kruger, 15 Hotbrook Road. There are some other people I believe would like to be brought in from our group on either Doug Donnell or maybe under his spouse's name, Deb Neubauer. Do you see that person? I do. And do yes. Also, uh, a Jesse Ferris, who is another homeowner, maybe uh, on your list, um, may, may show up for you, Pam. Yep. And, so each of you will have three minutes to make a okay. comment. That's fine. I just wanted you to know who was part of this group. And um, also, our attorney was hoping to attend, although there were some, she wasn't sure. Um, and that's Felicity Hardy. Do you see her? There is. Felicity oh, Hardy yeah. is here. As okay. an attendee, and okay. also um, Ted Parker is here, and he um, represents right. the developer. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you knew who the other people were. Um, I just make a quick couple of statements. Um, I think as a homeowner, it's just been really difficult because we feel like the town um, you know, dropped the ball with not collecting the uh, surety bond um, back in two thousand and four. So there isn't enough money to complete all the work. Um, it's great for uh, the town engineer to want everything fixed so that it doesn't come out of his budget, but we're looking for the town to help us resolve something that we can't resolve without the town and Tofino working together. So I feel personally the town's culpable for dropping the ball and also Tofino is culpable because they didn't get the <clears throat> work done to get the road accepted in a timely manner. So someplace in there, there needs to be a negotiation and a meeting. Um, with that, I'll just be quiet. You've heard from me before, and um, I'm hoping we can move along with this. All right, thank you, Connie. I see that uh, Felicity has her hand raised. <coughs> we'll let her go next. And if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so, um, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge um, Chris's excellent work on the memo that she provided the planning board. 
I, I really thought it was incredibly thoughtful and um, lays out the dilemma that um, the Meadows homeowners are in. We're kind of in a stuck place between the town's legitimate desire to have you know, roads, except roads that are in, you know, the condition that the town needs them to be in, on the one hand, and um, Tofino's issues with respect to the passage of time and the deterioration of the roads that have happened over time, on the other hand. Um, and I don't think that there's an easy solution to, to this, um, but I thought Chris did an excellent job of summarizing the options that are available for the board. Um, and then um, finally, I would just say um, it is true that the board is not obligated to make a recommendation, uh, but I think given how much time the board has spent on uh, listening to us and um, wrestling with the issues, you know, I'd encourage you to, to you know, think about it and figure out what um, the board thinks is the right path forward. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's see, Deb Neubauer has her hand or is it Doug Donnell with his yeah. hand raised? Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? Uh, it's Doug Donnell. Thank uh, you. Yes, speaking. We can. I, I tried to change the name and wasn't able to get in there quick enough. So my apologies Sorry, for not there. having the correct name up. Um, I just wanted to add one point of clarification. Uh, I second both Connie and Felicity's remarks. Uh, just for the record, uh, Doug Donnell, 46 Hopbrook, and I am the current president of the Homeowners Association, the Meadows Homeowners Association. Uh, just one point of clarification on the estimate that I got from Warner Brothers for Jason's uh, original extensive punch list. The, it actually, the total, uh, I'm not sure how Chris got the 200,000, but the, I believe the total is $133,000. I think, Chris, perhaps you brought the subtotal forward and added them both. Uh, Mr. So, Donnell, at least the, based on the information I received, there were two punch lists, once, one for each road. Uh, no. no. One, I think one that's was, right. Yeah. For, for Hopbrook, there was 133,000, and for Kestrel Lane, there was another seventy thousand. So they do add up to about two hundred thousand. Yeah, but didn't didn't they bring the subtotal forward on the first page to the second page, and then brought that down and and bring it to one hundred and thirty three thousand? I don't see that that happened on this. If you look at the top of the second page, there's a subtotal uh, of sixty thousand. They did. 000. The first. It is row. brought forward. It is brought oh, forward. Okay, total from Kestrel. Yep. Okay. So document. I. I don't, I don't, you know, again, this is, I'm not trying to, I, I just want to clarify that one piece of it. Yeah, uh, I see, I see what you're talking about. There it is at the top. Totally. You know, and I just like to reiterate the fact that this, that we are in a very, um, we're in a catch 22 here. We, we can't do work on the roads because we don't own them. We can't get Tofino to do work on the roads because they won't do that and the town won't do work on the roads because it's one not their responsibility and two they don't own them either uh, right. we do continue to pay taxes we are in a situation where you know 28 households bought houses assuming they were public roads honestly most people here think this is a public road uh and uh so that's just uh i just wanted to to communicate that piece of that this uh process to all of you. So thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Donnell. Um, Mr. Parker, you are a, able to speak if you wish to. And uh, I want to give you that opportunity before we go into discussion. OK, I guess uh, you'll stay quiet for now. All right. So. Um, Chris or Nate, do you have any further commentary you want to give us before we open it up for discussion? Or Jason? I mean, it sound, we've Jason had a chance to speak already. I could just offer that, that um, I would recommend that you take the first recommendation that is in the memo. Um, it is going to cost the town some money. 
but this is a problem that's been going on since 2004 and I've actually been talking to the homeowners since around 2012 and I feel like if it is um if if this first recommendation isn't taken we're going to be talking about this for the next few years and unlike um the Amherst Hills situation there's no um set of lots that haven't been released yet um so there's really no in my opinion um no um no forcing the developer to do what uh we would like him to do so um in fairness to the residents and you know in recognition of the fact that they have been paying taxes for the last 20 years or 18 years i guess since 2004 um you know everybody else i i shouldn't say everybody else okay so my road is heatherstone road and it's in terrible shape and tom long lives on heatherstone road too and he knows what bad shape that is and we've been paying taxes too but my point is that they have these residents have been paying taxes and so um you know having the town take over the road and do the maintenance on the road the plowing of the road all of that it, it makes sense to me at this point because it's been such a long time it really should have been resolved back in the early 2000s but it wasn't and here we are okay thank you chris all right um andrew i see your hand and i'm then bruce and then janet thanks doug um and i i'm on one screen here today so i don't remember remember what option one is but the town has been plowing the town will continue to plow is that correct regardless of the situation i do believe they have been plowing yes and yeah i, I know they have and i guess jason will they will will it, will we continue to plow the roads Provided it doesn't deteriorate to a condition where we're damaging plows, which Under, actually okay, getting that close. There's oh, is it? Okay, all right. That okay, no, for that. There's caved in manholes that could catch anybody right now. There's a barrel or a cone over them. But if you were to actually drive over them, somebody could get have vehicle damage or anything. Okay. okay. So it's getting close to the point where we need to say, no, we can't plow this anymore. I believe we will continue following it this morning. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Kind of reassess it as it deteriorates. Uh, okay, um, I, I, I mean, I, I one of the comments you made earlier really resonated with me. Of, I guess if we just accept the roads, is it a dangerous precedent to set? And I'm wondering when will the work actually ever be completed if the town does accept the roads. And I, I would really love to hear from uh, Mr. Parker on this, but um, it it seems like, um, in my opinion, that I mean, I would not recommend that. It, to me, it seems like accept, accepting them does set that precedent. The work will not get done. And um, I think actually also, uh, you make a really great point as well, Chris, in terms of um, while the road condition here might be suffering, it's also suffering in other parts of town. And for the for you know Jason to take accountability for this road is um, is maybe you know preventing Heatherstone from getting work. And um, you know I drop my my son off at Tom's house pretty regularly, and it's I have a, a four by four, and I don't like driving down Heatherstone Road. So I mean that said, um, I would love to just see this work done. Right? It, it seems it seems that. Um, if we were to accept them, we're um, we're kind of um, setting the dangerous precedent, giving them a, a, a get out of jail free card. And it's it's been 20 years. I guess I don't understand why it hasn't been done. And um, I think we should continue to keep that pressure on them. And and I mean, I hate to say it for the residents there, but you know, crossing my fingers that the plows don't break and we can continue to provide that service. There certainly are other roads in Amherst which are in very bad shape. And uh, let's let the developer complete the job. So Andrew, when you say let's get the work done, are you referring to the short list? Short? No, I think that I think or the full 130,000. I think the developer should do the full list. And I think that the short list is I, I think that's inadequate because I think the work will never get done or it'll be incumbent upon the town to complete it. And I don't think that's a, a fair proposition for 
the, the town residents who don't live on Hopper or Kestrel. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Bruce. Um, I just wanted to say that both Tom and I, uh, along with Chris and Jason and, uh, and Ted and uh, Connie and Don, uh, made a site visit earlier in the week. And, oh, and we were thank there you for reminding me. I'm sorry for not introducing you earlier. Well, I just wanted to, for the, the record to show that, you know, we're discussing this with at least of having had a pretty comprehensive site visit. We walked the entire length of uh, both of the roads. We were there for well, at least an hour and a half. Um, I, Tom, I don't know whether you want to say anything uh, as far as what, I mean, what I, I guess there's not a lot that hasn't already been said, but seeing the place was, was useful. And, uh, and it, 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 I guess we should probably remind ourselves that this is a, a low area that the uh, a lot of the damage is or, 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 let's say a lot of the uh, repair work required is caused by apparently seemingly by heaving uh, catch basins um, uh, and it's a, somewhat a condition of that um, the type of site so the, the work was done originally um, in, you know in accordance with the uh, approved drawings, so it, it presumably wasn't done uh, uh, improperly, but the, uh, the area has, uh, uh, particularly in the last 10 years, according to Jason, uh, where the, the, the deterioration has accelerated, uh, but it's also partly the, uh, the, the, the nature of the, uh, the high water table down there that's uh, adding to this. Another thing that I remember hearing was that uh, the uh, homeowners have committed to the homeowners association is committed to doing some of the uh, have committed to doing the brush uh, the clearing along the uh, the way some of the overhanging trees and so forth are affecting snow plows and the homeowners association is committing to doing work to clear all of that out so that i don't know whether i can't re I, I tried to see whether that was on the list uh either the 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 the, the long short list i couldn't tell i also couldn't tell whether I, I don't think the three um, shortlist items are included in the long list. Chris, is that correct? They're, they're a separate list. It's a short and separate shortlist. Is that correct? They, you have to ask Jason. I, I couldn't really figure that out. I tried to, but I couldn't figure it out. Well, perhaps I, I should. There's overlap. There, the, the shortlist items are included in the long list, although one of those items is turned less do a puddle and more of a washout. So the, the other thing we learned was that this is not a st static situation. It, it uh, is, so the, the cost of this is work is increasing because of inflation, but it's also increasing because uh, deterioration doesn't stop, it continues. And Jason pointed out that this ex it's a continuing at an accelerating rate. The, the absence of cracking, uh, uh, of, of uh, patching the, the road cracks is turning those road cracks into uh, problems that can't be inexpensively corrected. Uh, it's becoming more expensive. So something needs to be done clearly um, uh, sooner rather than later. Otherwise the expense will get uh, the, the, the 130,000 uh, will become a lot more, a lot faster. Um, and the question I have, I guess, uh, is the, uh, the, 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 the $23,000 that the town holds um the work that uh, tofino has agreed to do those three uh, shortlist items um and agreed to do and pay for is it paying for it out of that twenty three thousand that the town holds because i guess that's tofino's money that they're holding or is uh, that work being done when that work's done will that twenty three thousand dollars still be uh, sitting in the uh, town coffers uh, Chris, I would assume that Tofino will ask for that twenty-three thousand dollars back if they do the work and um, if the town accepts the road. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bruce. So, so we don't have twenty-three thousand dollars to 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 put into that hundred and thirty, is what I'm uh, as I was assuming, and it seems to be correct. But it but it does sound like if the short punch list gets completed, some of the items on the 130 
inventory will be taken off. Apparently, yes. Two items, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Chris, your hand is up again. Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm wrestling with the idea of what incentive does Tofino have to do the work, to do the full punch list. I'm not seeing that they have an incentive to do that work. And so I'm seeing an extended conversation of the planning board and the residents and a very Messy. trying time resolving this issue. Right. And usually when there's not a lot of incentive, it turns into a lawsuit that becomes an incentive to end the lawsuit and the expenses associated with it. All right, Janet. Um, so the last time we talked about this, and I'm not sure um, if the new board members were with us, um, Felicity, Felicity Hardy had mentioned that we have, the, the planning board could increase the, the surety. Um, and I think I, I understand, I recall that from reading the subdivision law. And um, so I think that might be a power the planning board could have is to um, increase the surety to cover the costs of completing the work that Tofina agreed to. Um, I think I asked for like, an opinion from KP Law if we could do that. And I think just because we haven't met again on that, I'm not sure that was done. Um, so that's potentially, a, a um, you know, a, we could do that. If we can do that, that would make sense. It seems to me like this, this is almost like a repeat of Amherst Hills um, in like a slow motion kind of disaster where it sounds like the planning board should not have released lots and Tofina should have done the work. And you know we have legal documents where they've agreed to do it. We shouldn't have done the release saying the roads were done and we're in this situation again. And the people sort of taking it on the chin are the homeowners. Um, and then as the longer we don't do anything or nobody fixes anything, you know, whatever should have been done makes everything worse and time is just making it worse. So I think it'd be great to get out of this log jam but I think the planning board could have a role in that. And I would love to have that confirmed by KP Law. That all said, um, I got super confused about punch lists and, you know, on the really the the um, the January 2021 punch list, was that just a list of items that needed to be done to make the roads look pretty good um, without doing a full scale repair? Or was that a list of things that Tofino should have done? And, um, you know, so I just wondered, like, and then, you know, there were also, you know, these huge 80 foot long patches, um, which suggested that the work was like more than, I don't know if that was fixing a problem that happened because Tofino didn't the work, or it's just that patching thing that I see going on all around town. So I really wanted to understand what work Tofino should have done. And if it created consequences, how much that work was versus just like normal deterioration you know, maybe maybe the town could pick up part of that tab. Maybe the homeowners could kick in some money. Tofino should definitely pay for their share and the consequences of not doing that. So I didn't, I just, the charts just didn't, you know, I just didn't, I had just questions about like who, what, and where kind of things. All right, thanks, Janet. Uh, Jason, can you clarify any of Janet's questions about the punch list? I think I can make an attempt at it. I mean, if, with the three punch list items from, I forget the date on those, from 2014 or 2012, had been done in 2014 or 2012, they would have been done. They could have pushed for acceptance. I would have needed an as-built plan, which they were pretty close on, and they could have gone, they could have just been pushed forward. Nothing happened. Ten years pass, and the road is falling apart. So the longer punch list is to get the road it's not getting the road up to a hundred percent, but it's at least it's sort of a compromise in the middle. Honestly, I, I this, you know, probably the, the the way to get the road back to nearly new would be like a full mill and overlay for the entire road, rebuild all the structures that are falling apart, do a fill mill and overlay, you know, mill out an inch of pavement, all that deteriorated pavement, mill that out and pave back another inch of pavement, and that would be pretty close to a new road. But what we the punch list I came up with is more of a compromise 
where there's large sections of failing pavement, we're milling that out and patching it. And then, then it would come through and crack seal everything and it would be as close to new as possible on the cheap which is, isn't cheap, it's $200,000, $250,000, but that's how the deterioration has affected the road. So the, the 133000 is most of the work on the 2021 list minus mm -hmm. the giant patches, right? Well, that includes the giant patches. It does not include the crack seal, and it might not have included some of the sort of underground work that needs to happen. There's a few leaky manholes, sewer manholes that have groundwater infiltration mm -hmm. that need to be sealed off. Um, I don't think that was included. I may be wrong. Okay, so if that work was done and then the crack sealing was done, how long would this road, these roads last before they had to go for the full kahuna, whatever that means? So if, if, it, if the crack seal was done appropriately <laughs> and everything else, you'd buy it another 10 years. And you might have to go in and crack seal every three years, but that's pennies on the dollars compared to mill and overlay or, you know, full depth reconstruction or anything like that. So you think you're, and you're, you're saying that the 133 covers the work that wasn't done and the consequences of that not being done, but not fully because that would be just doing the whole thing. Okay, I get it. All right, All right. thank you, Janet. <clears throat> Tom. Or actually, Tom, I'm going to let Connie Kruger jump in here. She's had her hand up for a little while. Um, this is just a small point, and I wish that Mr. Parker would speak for himself, but it was my understanding from a conversation with him in the last few days that they would do the three item short list and not request the 23,000. If that were true, and only he can confirm that, then it would be the three items plus an additional 23,000 to offset some of this other work, but I, I can't uh, speak for Mr. Parker, but that we talk, you were talking about that earlier, and I think that needs to be clarified by somebody. Thank you, Connie. Uh, Mr. Parker, I see your hand. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. Connie is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, let's, uh, okay, Mr. Donnell, why don't we go ahead and get your comment and then we'll go back to the board. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just, as you guys are uh, um, discussing this, uh, just to remember that there was about a 10 year period from 2007 to 2015. We, we have been petitioning Mr. Parker for uh, since the mid uh, 2010s to uh, to move on the road. And in, if it had been moved on earlier, I mean, we wouldn't be in this predicament. And so I just, I, it, the frustration is, is that there's been a lot of procrastination. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Tom Long. Thanks, Doug. And thank you everyone for your comments. I think, and I think Doug Donnell, I think your comment earlier really spoke to the, the, the catch 22 that, that I hear and I heard when I was on site. Um, hearing from all the different perspectives is that things should have been done 25 years ago. They weren't. Then they tried to be done 15 years ago. Then they weren't completed. Then they're supposed to be done in the last 10 years and they weren't completed. And it's just caused uh, what was a $20,000 um, fix 25 years ago to become a quarter of a million dollars today that we're discussing. And that when the homeowners don't own the road, the developer is not going to fix it, and the town doesn't want it, nobody's going to fix it, and we're all just going to sit here, as Chris said, and come back in two years or a year and have another conversation about this because of the Catch-22, because I don't think, um, Janet, as you suggest, I don't think we really do have that much leverage over this developer. And we don't have that much leverage over them in the region either to, to make them move on this in the way that I think would really meet the needs. And I think if we can take an extra $25,000 um, or 23 um, and use that towards the, the, you know, provide that for the town to complete some of this work, um, as well as to have um, um, 
you know, Ted's group finish uh, what was spec'd. And I think that's all we can do to, to at least get this, um, you know, get the roads into the hands of the town so they can actually be managed properly going forward. Um, and not the responsibility of homeowners who don't own them. So that's my opinion. Thank you, Tom. Um, that having, having been on site and walking for 90 minutes up and down the road, um, you can tell that um, consistently these aren't necessarily construction fails. Um, they are, this is a wetland and you can see the heaves up and down the road. Um, it's low lying, it's wet everywhere. Um, it's a problematic place to build anything. Um, that needs a foundation and a footing in, in wet ground that's going to freeze and then thaw. So it's a complicated place, and, and um, you know I, I, it's hard to pinpoint whose fault it was, when that fault happened, and when that fault caused another fault to cause. Like I said, it's a really complicated issue, and and you know I think I'm going to have to agree with Chris that the first recommendation seems like the best way to get this. Um, to, to move forward. I know that's not what Jason wants to hear, but um, I, I think it's some it's a way in which this can be dealt with properly going forward. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Um, Andrew. Thanks, Dick. I'm going to try not to regurgitate anything. Um, I mentioned this, I think, the last time we talked about it as well, but just, you know, for, uh, for the board and, you know, for the new board members, um, you know, we're talking about the developer and the town and, you know, who's paying for, for, for what. And I just wanted to remind folks a point I made earlier is that, you know, I had a very good friend who lived on Hopbrook who moved and um, had to make a discount to their selling price to account for this. Like they, they had to reduce their price by multiple thousands of dollars to account for the fact that the drain inlet at the end of their driveway was six inches below grade. Right, so it's 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 a cost that's borne by homeowners as well. Um, so I, I think it is important to humanize some of that stuff, and then also, you know, it, it's I know we're trying to get to a, a an expeditious solution here, but it seems as though we're just trying to find a way. I, I'm worried that we're just we're trying to make this happen fast instead of making it happen right, and you know, I would suspect that a developer expects to i mean part of being a developer is that you you do the job and you hand it over and um i'm not really giving the sense that uh, again you know I'd, I'd love to hear more from ted on this but I, I does ted feel like they did the job correctly and it's on the town's fault or is he acknowledging that they still have more you know they have a full punch list of work to do and they're not willing to do it it's been 20 years I, i'm i'm a little confused so Anyhow, humanize it, and uh, thanks for the time. All right, thank you, Andrew. Chris Brestrip, your hand is up next. Uh, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I wanted to say something in response to Janet's um, suggestion that the town try to recoup the $130,000 that they didn't um, get back in the early 2000s. And right now, the town doesn't have any um, leverage over Tofino to get them to give us that money. Um, that's something that should happen before the release of lots. And unfortunately, in this case, lots were released. Um, that, you know, that probably shouldn't have happened. There should have been um, receipt of those of those funds. But at this point, there's no um, there's no cudgel that we have to hold over the developer to get them to hand us a check for one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So I just wanted right. to make that point. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Bruce? Um, Jason, you can uh, correct me here if I'm not accurately stating the situation, but uh, essentially I agree with Tom. Um, and I think we should disabuse ourselves of the notion that this uh, is a punch list of uh, 40 or more items that somehow should have been done um, however many years ago by the developer. Um, take the catch basins, for example, uh, which uh, I, there's about 14 of them. One of, a couple of them are listed on that uh, 
estimate sheet from Warner's is uh, taking about $35,000 or $30,000 to do, and most of the rest of them are in the high hundreds. But uh, the aggregate there is quite a lot. But this is, uh, this is uh, uh, a consequence of heaving and so forth, which I have to imagine, and this is the point, Jason, that you might uh, uh, con uh, confirm or not, that um, if the town had have accepted these roads um, 15 years ago, that the town would now be dealing with the uh, heaving of these manholes and we wouldn't be expecting the developer to pay for it. So uh, there's a few things like that that have happened. Uh, and you know, in this case, I, it, it seems clear that it's because of the high water table down there and the nature of the site. Um, certain aspects of the infrastructure down there are more expensive than they are to maintain, say, up where I am in the sandy North Amherst uh, end of town. So uh, I don't think we should uh, uh, beat the developer up. Uh, we could beat them up perhaps on a number of things. Uh, we can beat the town up too on the mantle that Chris mentioned. Um, so there's, 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 there's a number of uh, opportunities to, to, to lay blame and so forth here, I think. But the, the circumstance here is that this is a, 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 a moving uh, series of degradation. And if the town had, of, uh, if Torfino had have gotten their act together earlier, and if the town had have been asked and agreed to take this uh, uh, these public ways, I believe that a good portion of what's on that uh, list would uh, by now be falling to the town. So I don't think it's fair that we should be looking at the developer to pay for the bulk of that list um, for that reason. Jason, right. am I speaking out of order here? Um, no, I'm, that's, you're, you're welcome to have your opinion on it. Um, I just don't see why it should come out of the DPW's budget. Okay, thank you. I guess I'm the thing I'm wondering is how how why the development was approved in the first place if it's an inappropriate place to be building roads. But uh, that's well under the that's water under the bridge. So um, I didn't say it was inappropriate. No need, no need for anyone to comment on that. Uh, I guess maybe down the line, somebody might decide that these roads should be gravel because they hold up better in the, in the soils that are under them. Uh, so we've heard from several members about their uh, opinion about which recommendation we might want to adopt. Uh, I, it's now 10 o'clock. Uh, Board members, do you feel that you want to continue this conversation this evening? Should we hold a meeting uh, next week to continue this discussion? Um, where do you stand on that? Uh, and just give me a very quick, like one sentence where you stand so that we can get through this quickly. Uh, Janet. I, I don't have a clear sense of a recommendation that we can give, or I can I could vote I could make. And I would like to find out if we can increase the, the performance bond or the surety, because I remember that from the subdivision control law. And I know attorney Hardy mentioned that I'd like just to tie that down. So I would be fine with meeting next week. I try to be, think that fast. Thank you, Andrew. Similar, although I'm unavailable next week, I do feel like it's not, we're not at the point where we can make a call right now. All right, Bruce. Oh, I, I'm uh, uh, for proposition number one, uh, perhaps modicate, modified a little by proposition number three. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen. I certainly don't feel that I'm in a position to vote on this yet. I'm, I'm waiting to see which expert sways me the most. Okay. Uh, Johanna. Um, we're in a pickle. I do, and I don't have a sense of like what more information we're gonna uncover in future hearings. So part of me feels like we need to just arrive at a conclusion and wrap up this topic. All right, thank you. And 
Janet. Oh, did Janet Tom. start? Janet started with this. Okay, so we haven't heard from Tom. Yeah, thanks. Doug. I mean, I, I think I was, you know, clear that I do support, um, you know, option one based on what I read, but I also want to express that I, I did in, in conversations on site with um, Bruce and Chris mentioned that I do feel like this is well outside of my scope of capabilities because this feels like a legal recommendation. I feel like I'm a moderator in a legal discussion um, about which I don't necessarily have all the information necessary and nor do I have the knowledge and, and understanding of precedent to make something like this, to make, to make any kind of formal recommendation. Um, so this is really a gut reaction, which is I feel like this needs to be resolved. And then if we don't do it today, or I guess next week would be fine if there was more information we think we could get. Um, but I do think it needs to be done right away, just because I, I think it's going to keep coming back to us in the future with numbers that start to swell to 300,000 and 400,000 as these things sink into the ground um, or maintain. Okay. Chris, uh, would you be able to have a meeting next week? I would be able to have a meeting next week. Um, and I wonder if Pam would be able to join me next Wednesday, just for this one topic. Chris, what is the date? I, I the 26th. 26th. 26th yeah. of October. I think so, so. Pam and I can make a team to support the planning board on the 26th. I think we should just go ahead with that. Yeah, I, I feel like we it's late enough that we ought to just continue this to next week. Do we want to ask Jason if he's available next week to come back, knowing that this is the only topic on the agenda? Yeah. Jason? I suppose I can come back. Yeah. We would we'll hope see. to get to you earlier. As long as there's no 51 Spalding Streets on next week. So. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Chris, uh, Janet has asked, you know, how, can how to find out if we have a way to increase the surety. Is I there any way? So. I mean, Wait. there's no leverage and there's no, you know, there's nothing to. No, we talked about it last time and our attorney told us we couldn't increase the surety, we could reduce it, we could chip away at it and give pieces of it back to the developer, but we couldn't increase it. Right. Um, so, so, but I'm willing to talk to the town attorney, I'm willing to call KP Law and lay out the situation to them and ask them if they have any advice for us. Need to point out well, the undeveloped uh, cul-de-sac up on Amherst Hills too. I'm sorry, Jason. There's a seven lot cul-de-sac in Amherst Hills that remains undeveloped. Okay. By the same developer. So I mean, wouldn't you know, just because all the leverage is gone in the meadows doesn't mean that all the leverage is gone. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like there's some, you know. I does anybody object to trying to meet next week? I, I know Andrew is unavailable. Everybody else think you're available? Can I make a quick comment, Doug? Do you mind? Sure, sure, Andrew. I would I would just say that if we don't have new information, then we shouldn't bother meeting. So unless Chris can't hear back from KP, I would suggest we don't. Um, and if we don't think we'll get new information, we just call it as we see it right now. And this is I mean, this is a recommendation anyway. This is not a yeah anything binding well, I, I, so, I can't see that we actually have a majority in any direction I don't know that we do and I don't know that'll change necessarily next week so is it is it worth it to um, go through all this effort to have a two-hour sort of in, I don't say morass but like a two-hour meeting next week where we still don't agree right you can decide that you don't have enough information or that you don't that it's too complicated or whatever you want to, however you want to characterize it, and you don't want to make a recommendation. That is a legitimate thing for you to do. Okay. You know, Doug, if I could jump in here, um, you know, so I, I used to do a lot of mediation, and I love the numbers. And so, you know, this, in you know, 
we have 133,000. I think we take off 20 for what Tofino will put in or maybe more. And then we have 23 in the surety. And so we're missing about $87,000. That doesn't seem like a lot of money to me. And I wonder in the intervening week when we research our legal options, if the parties could sit down and just say, okay, the homeowners might put in 20. Will Tofino put in 60? You know, something just to make, it's not such a big gap, but somebody has, people have to make an agreement to solve this problem and to push it onto the town to take on hundreds of thousands of dollars of liability it's a lot. It's a big ask, but I, I wonder if people can sit down and come to some, some get closer. So maybe we're not at 87, but we're at, you know, 50 and maybe Jason skills will find that in his budget or something, but. Well, I, I, I like your optimism, but you know, this has been going on for years and nobody's wanted to come, you know, kind of come to a mediated conclusion. So um, Jason, what did you have a thought? Oh yeah. I, oh, I unmuted. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to caution the use of that estimate. Um, that estimate is two years old now and asphalt prices have nearly doubled in the last year. So I would just caution using that exact estimate without putting a, a pretty high escalation clause on it. Because this past year I've spent over 50,000 extra above what I was planning to pay for a paving job in escalation fees because the cost of asphalt has uh, skyrocketed uh, okay. 10 times faster than the cost of gasoline and oil. Right. Uh, Tom? We I think that was a legacy hand. What's that? I think that was a legacy hand, sorry. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You are, your, your voice is very indistinct. He says it's oh. a legacy hand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Karen. I'm asleep. Um, is, there, is there information that we could get? Is it possible that one has to rethink this whole road as a money drain in the future? Are there, are there town roads that are gravel or, you know, can 28 houses be put on a different kind of a road and have that be a um, town road? It's, are there even options like that? Uh, I see Jason shaking his head no. Okay. We, have, we have two dirt roads in town that are just legacies from long ago. Uh, there's a few private dirt roads and that's where we want to keep it. We wouldn't okay. want any, we wouldn't want to accept a, a subdivision as a gravel road for sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Bruce. Um, because I'm not sure whether we're going to meet next week, uh, I'll make one last shot at uh, resolving it tonight. Um, you want to make a motion, Bruce? I move that uh, uh, in uh, an effort to resolve this matter, uh, and given that there is uh, um, culpability all around, I don't know whether we want to say it that way, that uh, we recommend that uh, the town council pursue uh, Chris's option three. Which one was three? I'm sorry. It's the one that says it's a negotiated agreement. My sense is that we've already, it's going to be that way to some degree. So making that recommendation, is, is, there's a wide bandwidth for uh, for what it means. Um, so I think that in some respects, that's really the soft option. Uh, it's almost the same as making no recommendation at all, uh, sadly, but uh, but it is a recommendation that uh, that the town should uh, uh, move towards adoption. And it uh, and it recognizes that others uh, uh, that all parties can contribute. And, and I think that, uh, that, that, the, uh, that the motion should include that the uh, that the homeowners be a party uh, to this as well, because they're already offered to. All right, Bruce, you have your motion on the table. Does anybody want to second that? Uh, I see Karen's hand. I second it. All right. Um, all right, does anybody want to, well, actually I see Felicity's hand. Felicity? Um, I was just going to say, um, it's actually a point 
from a few minutes ago that for the town to accept a gravel road would be a major deviation from the accepted plan. I mean, you have a plan yeah. for that subdivision that's 20 years old. I just don't see going backwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so Bruce is recommending that we accept that we adopt uh, recommendation number three to recommend that the town negotiate an agreement with Tofino. And uh, I think, Bruce, you wanted to include the, the homeowners. Homeowners Association, yes. Association uh, to share the costs of completing the punch list items prior to acceptance of the roadway. <clears throat> yes, I think that's where we all are in one way or another, except for Andy. Uh, any further discussion from uh, board members? And we're going to go to a vote on this motion. Uh, Bruce, I'm assuming your hand is a legacy. Tom? Is, is there a time frame for this? Because, I mean, if we're saying, hey, let's, let's have everyone have a conversation and try to meet in the middle, <laughs> it's just going to drag this on for, well, you know, again, another two years. That's and, our, that's our said, recommendation to town council. So. I guess yeah. they, can, they can dictate the, the timeline when they yeah. adopt our recommendation or not. Uh, yeah, Tom, the recommendation doesn't uh, have any reference to meeting in the middle. Um, it, it might be uh, to one end. Uh, the, the, there's, no, there's no suggestion that in that recommendation right. that each party should contribute equally to the settlement. Right. All right. Thank you, uh, Johanna. I would just be interested in hearing Chris's thoughts on the pros and cons of this recommendation over others. All right. Thank you. Chris, do you want to say anything? I don't think I want to say anything at this point. No, thanks. I think I've said everything I want to say. Okay. Thank you. All right, board members, how do you feel about this uh, motion? We're going to go through, I guess. Uh, one at a time. Uh, Andrew, you want to say something before I go I, through it? I was only going to say that uh, if this were to not pass, I would I would put a motion for option two. So if anybody thinks that's a better one, um, I would offer that if we don't gain consensus on this. All right. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Uh, Bruce? Aye. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Nay. Janet. You're muted, Janet. Oh, can you skip me and come to me at the end? I'm not, I'm just very unsure. All right. Johanna. I'm gonna abstain. Oh gosh, we're okay. Karen. Aye. And I guess I'm an I as well. So I guess that's four in favor. Uh, Janet, you you need to vote. I'll be an I. That's a five in favor, one abstention and one opposition. Chris? Okay. We had a majority to make that recommendation. Yes, thank you. And I right. think I'll, I'll give the uh, town council a copy of my memo along with the report on this vote, okay? Is that all right with all you? Right. Yep. Um, Chris, could I, I think it'd be good to kind of parse out the numbers um, to the best of your ability about kind of what Jason was saying in terms of, the, you know, all the lists were very confusing. If sort of just saying, kind of laying out what he did that 133 would cover getting the roads for 10 years if we started doing the, um, whatever the rubberizing or whatever that is, sealing. The crack sealing. 
because I found those charts really confusing. Uh, all right, Doug, Doug if I may, uh, yes. I, I think that the town council are going to get all of this information uh, independently and probably uh, with a little bit more time uh, to, so I, I, I don't think we need to qualify what we heard because they're going to get it uh, in a revised and refreshed form anyway, I would think. Yep. Fair point, fair point. Yep. Town council is going to want their best information they can get. All right, so the time is 1017. We are finished with item five on our agenda. Item six, Chris, any old business? No old business, but I think we do have some new business, but I think it's just going to be introduced. All right, let's go on to new business, item seven. Karin wanted to put something on the table about um, working with developers to provide bike storage and bike lanes and bike paths. And I'm not sure if she wants to say more about it, but what I said to her was that if she introduced the topic tonight, we could put it on an agenda for a future meeting. All right, Karen, do you want to say anything? No, it's late and I think that's it. I think it would be good to discuss it at a future time. Okay, very good. Uh, Chris, I assume no other new business? No other new business, no. Nope. All right. Uh, any uh, Form A, A and R subdivision? No. Not tonight. All right. Upcoming ZBA applications? I have nothing new to report. All right. Upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Yes, we received one today, and it's for um, the building that used to house Oh, uh, it was a, an Asian restaurant and aerobic studio on Belchertown Road. It's near, um, it's near what used to be the Snoco station. That's all in transition now. Anyway, um, I think it's ServiceNet that's coming forward to use part of that building. So you'll be seeing a um, site plan review for that in the upcoming weeks. All right, thank you. Ooh. Uh, planning board liaison committee and committee liaison reports, uh, PVPC, Bruce, anything you want to say? Um, I, I, I don't believe I've actually been formally appointed. Uh, uh, Chris has established that uh, this is an appointment uh, by the town manager, that uh, our vote was simply a recommendation to him. Uh, there was a meeting of the uh, commission last week. Uh, I thought of attending, but I didn't because I, anyway, I didn't. And Jack was there and, and uh, he forwarded some information to us, uh, which has been relayed. So okay. that's Thank you. Andrew, anything on uh, CPC? Yeah, uh, I hate to keep us going here. Um, but we had 15 recommendations from, uh, or applications rather, for CPAC. I, um, earlier this afternoon, I forwarded the presentation schedule to Chris, uh, Doug, and Pam, uh, and would ask if you could just send it on to the rest of the planning board. Um, presentations will happen over three weeks. And, um, you know, I'm kind of a little embarrassed to say this because, um, other committees um, have kind of solicited feedback from, from uh, or other boards have solicited feedback from their members relative to the proposals. And I, I realized I haven't really done that. And so I would, I would love to get uh, any feedback from members of the planning board relative to the proposals, um, whether they feel that, uh, you know, they, you know, would support one or the other. I guess it's also a, a matter, like a point of discussion for the board at large is would we want to discuss uh, the applications as a board and see if there's a, uh, you know, this is something that we'd like to discuss as a formal community. Um, those 15 applications uh, <laughs> span community housing, historic pr preservation and open space and recreation. So, um, Again, Chris, if you don't mind forwarding that, um, I would appreciate it. And then, uh, you know, Doug, if uh, if you want to carve out some time at a future meeting, like probably our next meeting or, you know, within the next two meetings, maybe, to get feedback uh, from this board, I would, uh, I'd love that. I'm 
again, apologize. I'm in a little bit of a, a rogue element here representing myself more than the board. And I, I'm a designee for the board. So I want to make sure that I'm capturing all of your feedback. So okay. That's my update. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Um Tom, I guess DRB. Um, I was uh, down and out with COVID last meeting, so I missed our last meeting. Um, I owe you an update on that, so I will put that together. We do have an upcoming meeting, um, which is yet to be scheduled, but should be scheduled before we um, meet next time. So I should have an update for a couple meetings next time. Okay. Uh, Janet, the Solar Bylaw Working Group. You are muted. I was just glancing at our minutes from last week, because it was two weeks ago, and I can't remember. But basically, um, the um, town has hired a person to do the solar assessment and work on community outreach for to figure out community preferences and values. And we'll be meeting with that person this Friday um, and get a presentation on their what they're doing with the assessment. Um, and then last two weeks ago, Jack Jemsek presented a paper, a, a draft white paper on by the, I have to get this wrong, the Water Supply Protection Committee on, um, you know, on solar and um, water supplied lands. And actually, just thinking about, it, I think I should circulate it to the board, um, some of the information. It was sort of finding recommendations, but also some fact finding and things like that about um, putting solar and how to protect um, water supply. So I could just send that around. All right, sounds good. Send it to Chris, please. Yes. And then uh, Chris, anything on CRC? The CRC is meeting on um, next Thursday, the 27th to talk about flood mapping. And um, I should have mentioned under new business or old business, that we got our flood maps. So we have our maps and we're going to have a continued meeting about that on the 2nd of November. But in any event, the CRC will be discussing the flood maps on the 26th and I can't, or the 27th. And I can't tell you how pleased I am to tell you that we finally <laughs> have the maps. Um, and what did they discuss in the past? I think we've had a continuing discussion with them on um, food and drink establishments and we will be bringing um, a public hearing to you about food and drink establishments on November 2nd. So you've seen a draft of this and you'll be seeing it more uh, fully formed and um, hopefully you'll have a good discussion about that. All right. Um, report of the chair, given the hour, I'm just gonna pass tonight. Chris, report of staff. I will never again say I think this is going to be a short meeting. I, I will thank you for that <laughs> promise. All right, the time is 1025. And unless anybody objects, we will adjourn. And thank you all for sticking this out. Thank you. Good night. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.